Okay, here we go, kicking off another webinar presentation. This is Michael Saltzman from Blue Sky Bio, and I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining us for our webinar presentation. We're continuing with the 2022 webinar series. Information and schedule regarding the upcoming webinar series can be seen at blueskyplan.com forward slash webinars 2022. And you could go to that web address as well to see past recordings of previous webinar sessions. Definitely recommend checking out what we have coming up, registering for the webinar sessions. Each one is a free session, approximately an hour, and you'll be awarded one C credit. And as I mentioned, you could view from there the past recordings of past webinar presentations. A few technical items before we get started. If you have any questions during the webinar presentation, please enter them into the QA <clears throat> question and answer chat box. And we'll be sending the CE credits within a week or two after the webinar presentation. This presentation, along with the past ones, barring any technical difficulties, will be recorded and available on our website and available via our social channels as well. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from the one and only Dr. Corey Glenn. He's a man who I don't think needs much of an introduction at all, but I'll introduce him briefly. He's a dentist, speaker, trainer, and tech developer called the Dental MacGyver for coming up with creative ways to deliver care more affordably and efficiently and speak extensively on digital dentistry throughout the world. He operates a training center where he teaches dentists digital workflows and techniques. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing him present on the topic of advanced techniques in Blue Sky Plan. Corey? All right, good day. And then you can still hear me good? Uh, yep. Awesome. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate you uh, letting me do another one of these. And so I was tasked with the uh, job of doing the advanced techniques. And so obviously that can go a lot of different directions and uh, depending on kind of feedback, if there's something y'all want to cover more or less of, uh, I'll be happy to do that because I've got no shortage of slides. Uh, I don't think I've ever done one of these, Michael, where I did it in under two hours. So that's my that's my target today. I'm going to finish in under two hours. So we wish you luck. Uh, yes, I know. I'm going to need it. Uh, as, as Michael mentioned, just a quick plug. So myself, uh, Dr. Brian Correa and Dr. Ben Kellum all uh, operate Transcend Dental Education in Huntsville, Alabama. So we've got a CE facility. Uh, literally have every dental technology toy that exists in dentistry, except for Serona products, because for whatever reason, they don't love me, but uh, we've got everything else and, uh, you know, teach on digital dentures, in-house crowns, ExoCAD, uh, guided surgery, all kinds of stuff. And hopefully soon we'll be also doing uh, live patient clinical courses. So if you want to learn to place implants or get better at dentures or whatever, uh, we'd love to have you. Just a couple of pictures of our facility. So uh, we, we bought a 7,500 square foot uh, place and about half of that is being renovated right now into a clinic, which hopefully in about a month will be finished and we'll be starting to see uh, patients and our clinic's gonna more or less operate like a nonprofit. You know, we're trying to provide really high end treatment to low income people who could never otherwise afford it because our, our primary business is not the clinic. The clinic is more of a charity type thing. Uh, our main business is in education and in our digital lab, make surgical guides, implant restorations, uh, anything digital you can think of. Uh, and anyway, it's got lots of toys. So if you're ever interested in a course on any of these topics, or if you like any of the stuff we covered today, uh, check out our websites, transcendde.com for dental education. And then our lab is transcenddigitallab.com. Uh, that's our wallow printers. Uh, this is our, our lecture room set up. So we just, uh, it's right in the middle of our lab. So the cool thing about how we designed it is that, you know, we're in the lecture room talking and all the stuff that we're talking about, the technologies are literally all around you. So we can do demos and let everyone play with it. Um, mills, printers, photogametry, just whatever you can think of. So we'd love to see you there. Um, so I had not shown this case. So I always try to start a little bit easier and then work into the, the bigger, more complex stuff. And so what I've gotten most requests to cover is on the stackable type guides that uh, our lab is doing now and just showing a little bit of that process. Obviously I'm not gonna be able to do it in the greatest detail, just given the time, 
because uh, those cases take about three three hours per arch to plan. So it would literally take beyond this whole webinar just to do a, an arch. But I've tried to do some videos of the process, condense it down. Uh, but before jumping to that, I want to start out easier. So this is a great technique for guided surgery for full arch cases in circumstances where it permits. And what this is, is a soft tissue guide, which if you've done much in blue sky plan, you know, is extremely easy to make. Uh, you literally just plan the implants and then it's a single button push and it generates a guide. The downside to those uh, soft tissue supported guides is that at least from my perspective, I don't think they're conducive to most cases because very few people have enough attached gingiva that you can just take a five millimeter chunk out of it and drill straight through tissue. You know, I was taught in my residency, you'd go straight to dental health for doing that. So I uh, wasn't a huge fan and generally went more bone supported, but I figured out this technique, which uh, is just a really a, a difference in sequential steps, but still it's soft tissue guide. And it really makes it where you can do these on more complex cases, basically any full arch that doesn't require bone reduction, uh, this will work. So this is our patient. She uh, uh, was a patient that we were doing a charitable case on, had uh, graduated from a drug rehab program. And so she had already had her teeth pulled and was in a set of dentures, which she liked. And that's always uh, the, the best scenario, because if they've got a set of dentures that they like, then you're off to the races. You just need to do a dual scan on them and you've got all the data that you need to go ahead and do the case. Now, caveat to that is if they don't have an ideal set of dentures, if they're loose fitting, teeth are in the wrong position, collapse vertical, any of those scenarios, you really ought to start by getting an ideal set of dentures first, because when you do that dual scan, that's how the teeth are going to show up. And we don't need to know where these ugly out of position teeth are. We need to know where ideal teeth should be in that person's mouth. So if, if they don't have an ideal set of dentures, then what I would suggest is go ahead and just take some impressions or scans and just make them a quick and dirty printed digital denture. It doesn't have to be fully processed and expensive. Uh, you're just looking for something to get the teeth in the right position. So again, we had that in her uh, scenario. You can kind of see the lines, midline's good, vertical's good, all that. So what we're gonna do is a dual scan. And so the dual scan technique is very simple. It's been around forever. You're just gonna take that ideal denture and you're gonna place some radiographic markers uh, in multiple spots around it. So I'll usually do like four around on the buccal flange up above the teeth, and then maybe two to three on the palate. And then you're going to put that in the patient's mouth and close them into their full vertical, all right? So I know you're gonna hear me repeat this a bunch today, but in a tooth borne case, we're always thinking, get the teeth apart, right? Because we've got to stitch in uh, into oral scans. And if the teeth are all together, it makes that job very difficult. Full arches are a whole different animal and you actually want to scan them at the correct vertical dimension uh, in occlusion. So that's gonna mean that you've got to use the, the chin rest attachment as opposed to the bite fork but that's gonna come out a lot better. You'll see why that is as I go along. Uh, quick notes, you know, sometimes they do have a good denture, but maybe it's just a little sloppy with the fit. If that's the case, reline it before you do your scan. Now I've got acrylic written here, but you can actually reline that with just medium body PVS. That will work just fine. But the reason for that is if you're doing a soft tissue guide, your guide will never end up fitting any better than the denture did at the time of the scan because it's literally just a duplicate of it with holes built into it. So keep that in mind. And again, here, just stressing that you, you scan them in the desired VDO in full occlusion. So to, to tell you why this is important, you know, when we're doing a full arch, if it's, if it's not an immediate load case, it's not that big a deal. But if you're gonna do immediate load, then realize you've got to design prosthetics ahead of time. So if I do this where I take the patient and I scan them with cotton rolls or a bite fork between their teeth, then this is how it's gonna come out, right? So let's say I'm doing a dual arch, immediate load on both arches. So I could, I could set up the maxillary teeth based on this denture, assuming this was a good denture and we wanted to match that, then that makes it easy to set up the, mandib or the maxillary teeth. The problem comes in with where do I now set the mandibular teeth? right? Because if you're setting this up in exocad or three shape or blue sky, you pull in those teeth and they're going to be somewhat pre-occluded. And 
here we, we can't do that, right? The jaws are open. So I'm going to have to do my setup. And basically the best you can do is to try to set the teeth up and match these as closely as possible, but it's not ever going to be that precise. You're for sure going to have more grinding in of the occlusion. And so it's a lot better if you can just get them in a full occlusion to start with. And that way there's no guesswork. Your occlusion is going to come out dead on uh, and you won't have any issues. And if you get into these big complex cases like the stackable ones, it creates even more problems because now you have to basically for the mandible have duplicate files of everything. You know, the, these cases, you might end up with 30, 40 STLs in the case to start with. And then if you got to double all of those for the mandible, that just sucks. You know, it's too much uh, clutter in the case uh, because you're going to have to have one set that's stitched to the CT but you're gonna to have to have a duplicate set that's actually brought up and that's in the proper orientation to the maxilla. So there's ways around it, but it's so much more effort. Just put them in occlusion, you'll be much happier for it. And then one other thing, I've shown this before, but no bite forks if they have a removable denture because what happens when they bite on a denture on the front teeth? Well, it's not fixed. So it's gonna dip down in the posterior. And a lot of times people don't catch that. So this is a, a guy who'd taken my course, uh, his first guided case, and he actually had him on the books, I think for like the next day. And he just wanted me to look at something. And I immediately saw this and thought, oh crap, you know, call and uh, cancel the patient because we got problems here. Uh, what immediately jumped out at me is if you see this big black space up under the denture, that's all airspace. Because if you look here on the bottom right, they used a bite fork. Implants on the lower, so those were good and fixed, but as he as she bit down on that, the denture just dipped down in the posterior, the anterior teeth all moved up. So not only are his implant positions going to be off because they're planned based on teeth that are not in the right position, but secondly, you imagine this denture is what's going to get duplicated into the guide. Well, when he puts that that denture or the, I'm sorry, the guide into that patient's mouth, it is going to fully seat. So now your positions of your implants are going to be totally different from where they were in the, in the case. And if you don't have a lot of excess bone, then that's going to be a problem. You'll end up perfing out the buckle or lingual. It's just not ideal. So uh, all that to say, we did a dual scan on this patient. She had upper and lower dentures. Uh, we were just going to start with the upper arch. And so we did the dual scan, radiographic markers everywhere. Comb beam scanned her wearing that in occlusion. Comb beam scanned the dentures by themselves. Um, I'll go back here. One other thing I would tell you for the dual scan, you know, you got to take the comb beam of the patient wearing them and then the comb beam of the denture by itself. When you do that comb beam scan of the denture, be sure to put it up on some paper towels or a sponge or something to get it up off that plate. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with what you see on the bottom left here, which is a denture with a big table on the bottom of it. And we don't want that, right? It obscures the positions of the teeth. You can't see what you need to see. Uh, it's going to make your guide all nasty looking. So make sure you get that thing up off the platform before you do the combing scan of the denture alone. So we did our dual scan. Uh, <clears throat> open that data in blue sky. So you'll always open the patient CT scan first. So the thing you ought to notice is that the dentures don't show up here at all. I can't see them whatsoever because acrylic is extremely radiolucent. You're not going to be able to pick that up on the CT. However, you can see the radiographic markers, right? And so those <clears throat> radiographic markers are going to allow the software to auto stitch a, a denture back to this, right? So we pull in the dentures and here you can see the upper and lower dentures in full occlusion, there's not gonna be any guesswork if we were doing immediate load and everything is oriented properly together. So now I know where tooth positions are and that's gonna make it easy to now plan the implants backwards from that. Now I went ahead and did segmentation on this case, honestly, just because for pictures, because there was no need to do it. Uh, that's the beauty of doing this type of cases. You don't have to do segmentation, which really ups the ante on these cases. But I did it just because I wanted to print the models and make some cool uh, slides and whatnot. But really, all I needed was this denture, okay? So you can notice here on the model outline, one of the ways you can check that that is, in fact, in the proper position, first of all, you should not see any airspace up under that denture. So notice here, there's no black space like on that slide that I showed previously. 
Um, and then secondly, if you were to scroll through where those radiographic markers show up, you should notice this outline extending out around those little radiographic glass balls. Uh, and that gives you a verification that you have a good stitch. Furthermore, you can also see anywhere that there's an airspace, that's going to show up as a dark black. And so we can actually confirm, yeah, the outline of this denture is in fact corresponding to where it goes from tissue to that dark black. Now, uh, something myself, many people would advocate is get in the habit really on all your CTs, but especially ones where there's dentures involved or when there's high scatter. If they've got a lot of restorations, this can absolutely save your butt because you might have so much scatter, you can't stitch based on the teeth. However, you might be able to manually manipulate it and align the tissue boundaries where there's not scatter. So get in the habit of stuffing their cheeks full of cotton or gauze, uh, put some in the palate, put some you know, between the tongue and the ridge. Uh, that can really, really help you in these cases. All right, this is just showing the stitch of that lower again. You see the radiographic marker bowing out there. And so here's where we plan the implant position. So uh, I said upper arch, we did the lower arch first. So notice in these, I can see the outline of that denture. So in every implant <clears throat> side that I'm doing, I know exactly where we're gonna emerge out of those teeth, right? So for example, I wanna try, if I can, to use straight up and down implants. If I'm gonna do that, I need to be coming through occlusal surfaces in the posterior and just lingual to the incisal edges in the anterior which we were able to do here. Uh, thankfully, she had a good uh, amount of bone. And so we went ahead and planned the implant positions. Also be mindful that you've got to plan your restorative space. So here again is another big reason why you don't just do a cone beam scan of an edentulous patient and then throw implants in. Because yeah, you'll be able to place them where you planned, but you have no idea where the teeth belong, right? I'm such a big advocate that you've got to do the proper planning on these and know where teeth belong before you jump in and start doing irreversible treatment. So knowing now where these teeth belong, I can plan backwards, right? So if we're going to do a hybrid, I know that I need 15 to 17 millimeters of prosthetic space. So I could simply use the measuring tool and go backwards from sizal edge 15 to 17. And that tells me how deep the implants need to go. Now I mentioned to you, this is a soft tissue case. However, my implants are subcrestal here. So my general rule is if the implants are beyond five millimeters subcrestal, that probably needs to be a bone supported guide with bone reduction. Five millimeters or less, then I think you can go ahead and place the implants through that. And even if they go four millimeters subcrestal, you can always do the bone reduction after the fact. When you start getting beyond about five millimeters, the wag factor of your drill, you're just drilling so deep that that apical end has too much uh, deviation and you just don't know where it's going to end up. So again, that's my general rule is five millimeters or less uh, subcrestal and I'll consider a soft tissue supported guide. And here's the prosthetic emergence of those positions. So once I have all the implants positioned, ideally, we got six in this arch. Then I'm going to go ahead and place some uh, buckle lateral stabilization pins. Excuse me. Okay, so the pins, if you're doing this on a soft tissue supported guide, right, then obviously they need to pass through both the denture and into the bone. Otherwise, you're just not pinning anything together. So those are our pin positions. Uh, always try to make sure that they are well clear of the implants. If there's existing teeth in the picture, I try my best to avoid uh, hitting those roots because one, they're hard to drill through Two, you know, if you pin it into place, that tooth's now locked in, you're not going to be able to extract it during this process. Uh, here it was a dentulous, so that didn't really matter. And here is the surgical guide. Now I didn't uh, do a video on how to make these because I've got tons of them on YouTube and most of you probably know how to do this, but literally it is as simple as turning on the guide tubes and then go into your guide panel and then just say, create scan appliance guide. And what happens is it's going to duplicate this denture, but just build in those guide tube holes. And again, it's gonna fit exactly like the denture because it's a duplicate of it. That's why you wanna have a good fit at the time of scanning. So this was the resulting surgical guide. And this was done for the Blue Sky Bio fully guided keyless kit, which I think is the best uh, guided kit out there. Uh, you know, as a, as a lab that makes surgical guides for people, 
and having to make guides for other systems, keyed systems, all that crazy stuff. Those are an absolute nightmare, not only to plan with, but secondly, to actually use surgically. They're just a nightmare. Access is horrible. They're insanely expensive because there's so many parts and pieces. They're just not a good option. So listen, I, I would love you to place blue sky implants. I'm obviously not impartial there. Uh, but even saying that, it doesn't matter whose drill makes the hole, right? The body doesn't know whose drill made the hole and it doesn't know whose titanium you're screwing into it. You just need accurate holes. So my suggestion would be if you're going to uh, consider getting a guided kit outside of Blue Sky, I would still consider getting the Blue Sky fully guided keyless kit or someone else's fully guided keyless kit. Again, it doesn't matter that the brands match up. What matters is the hole sizes are accurate. And secondly, that it's easy to use surgically. So this was our surgical guide. And, you know, again, I was just trying to be fancy. So I made all this fancy model work, but this was a, a unique thing I did on this case that I hadn't done before. So in, in the past, when I've used soft tissue supported guides, right, you would just stick it in there and then hold it with a finger against the palate and now drill your buckle uh, uh, stabilization pins, right? And that always, you know, wigged me out a little bit. I was always nervous about it moving, compressing tissue. So in this scenario, what I did is I actually just came back. Remember, I've got the original STL of her denture. And then I've got this new resulting guide, which most of the teeth will be trimmed away because that's where your implant tubes are. All I did was a Boolean difference of the two. I subtracted the surgical guide from the original denture. And what was left over were these tooth pieces, right? It's basically uh, something that would drop into those guide holes. And now it's back to the full contour denture. Now, the reason that's helpful other than just looking cool is because now when I go to drill my, uh, my buckle stabilization pins, if I had those teeth on it, I can just put this thing in and have her bite down an occlusion. And that's gonna free up her lips, right? Where I can pull the lips back farther and have more slack in them to drill these because sometimes it's a bit difficult to get up there to drill those. Um, and secondly, I know for a fact it's in the right position and her jaws are gonna hold it stable. So I would stick this in, take my 2.2 drill and then drill each of those pin tubes. And then normally the way most people would do this would be that they would then stick the pins in and proceed with surgery flapless. Again, I, I mentioned already, I don't love that. I've done it, but I don't love it. Uh, I just don't think most people can spare the keratinized gingiva to do that. So instead what we did here is we just drilled the holes and then took everything out. So the pinholes were drilled flapless. Everything else uh, is gonna actually be flapped though. All right, printed up the models. This is just the uh, jawbone, so you can kind of see what we're working with. And this is how it all pins together. Uh, you can kind of get an idea of how everything's gonna look. This is the uh, mandibular guide. Now, what you don't have tissue on this, right? And this is a soft tissue supported guide. So what's holding it in the proper orientation? Well, the pins are. Um, so here we are clinically, right? We've put this in, she's got her upper normal denture in, and then the lower, we've just got the teeth on the guide, bite it into place, and now flaplessly drill each of those pin tubes. Okay, uh, this uses the uh, drill T22S, which is matched up with the Blue Sky Bio pins, which is pretty much all I use. And then once those uh, pin holes have been drilled, now I'm gonna remove the teeth, all right? These just flop right out. And now you could go ahead and start your surgery, but here's where it deviates from how I've done this in the past. What we did is took an indelible ink stick and we just wet it and then go through each of the osteotomy holes and we're gonna mark that site on the tissue, okay? And then take the guides out. So again, this is where it's different. So now I'm looking at the tissue and I can see all those purple dots. I know exactly where those implants need to go. So now I'm gonna make an incision. I say, I, this is not myself doing this surgery. I planned this and uh, shout out to my buddy, Aaron Carmine, who's a dentist here in Winchester. Uh, he was kind of just learning implants at the time. And this was literally his first full arch case ever. Uh, we had done, you know, maybe five or six uh, single unit implants that I'd helped him with. And then this was his first full arch. So uh, it's a pretty impressive surgery to be his very first full arch. Way better than my first full arch. I can tell you that. 
So since I know from those purple marks exactly where the implants are going to end up, I suggested to him, go ahead now and do a you know, molar to molar incision and carry your incision just lingual to those implant sites, right? Because we, again, we don't want to chew up the tissue. So flap that, reflect it down. I think it's good practice to reflect all the way down to the mental nerve so that you can see that and visualize it, and verify that you're not impinging on it. Um, but notice that there's no lingual flap, okay? So the way this is going to work is that you put the guide in and it's still supported by all the soft tissue on all of the lingual, but now the buccal tissue is gone. So it would have the tendency to flop down and not be stable if you just used it as is. That's again, where those buccal stabilization pins come into place. So it's supported by tissue on the lingual, pins on the buccal. And once you do that, it's rock solid. That thing's not going anywhere and it's super accurate, okay? So lingual tissue supporting this, and then you got to kind of feel around and find the pinholes. And once you get one lined up and the rest of them are going to go right to place, but now you know that this is still in the exact same position as it was when she was occluding on it. So now I can do surgery and I'm not going to have to sacrifice her keratinized gingiva. Again, few people have the, the keratinized gingiva to spare, especially on the mandible. And so now we can do a flap surgery still a very atraumatic flap you know it's it's just reflected just barely beyond those pin tubes and so we're doing the blue sky fully guided keyless kit so you're going to use the bone mill first to profile out a flat spot on the ridge so that your drills don't want to walk off and then you'll follow that with the two by six and i usually kind of go diagonal so i'll go two by six two and a half by eight three by 10, I just kind of work my way diagonally up until I'm at my final length and width. And, you know, try to be efficient with your drills. You know, it'd be crazy to go through all the sequence in like one site and place that implant and then come over and do all the drills in the next site and then place the implant. Use each drill to the maximum that you can. So when you put on that bone mill, that's the first drill in every single site. Use it in every one of them then every single site's gonna need the two by six. Take that, use it in every single site. And then it's only as you start getting to the final drill sizes that you'll start skipping around a little bit. So we drill all the osteotomies first and then we'll place the implants all together. Uh, now, obviously Aaron was, this is his first full arch, right? So nervous as a cat, just as I was, I was much more nervous because I didn't have the guide when I did this for the first time. but. Uh, you know, wanted to make sure we were clear of the nerve. So we took a few check films. I find most people after doing guided surgery for a couple of months, never take check films anymore, unless there's a really questionable scenario, but it's good peace of mind. If it makes you feel better, do it. Um, and we could see that we were well clear of the nerve here. And so we proceeded. This was the two and a half by eight that we took the check film with. And now that all the osteotomies have been uh, made, we're going to go ahead and fully guide the implants into place. So this is the guided ratchet driver, and you essentially push it through the hole and you start cranking it in until this stop right here bottoms out on the top of the guide tube. And the moment that stop touches, you've got to quit cranking, because if you don't, there's only two things that can happen. Either you're going to break or distort your guide because that implant's gonna keep pulling it down into the bone and now you're off on your accuracy. Or if it doesn't do that and the guide holds up, then the implant is still spinning, but it can't get any deeper. And now you've turned that implant into an auger. You're gonna lose all your primary stability. So really watch and make sure that you stop the moment that uh, that hard stop at the top of the driver touches the guide tube uh, and you're at depth. You don't need to do any more. All right, so here we're about a millimeter or two shy of being fully seated. Just slow down as you get to that point, crank slowly until you feel it snug up and you know you're, you're seated and then you're done. And we got great torque on all these implants. They were all between 40 and 60 Newton centimeters. So this would have been a great case for immediate load. We didn't immediate load it because that's, that's a lot to do on your very first case. Uh, you know, that's pushing it a little too much. So we opted just to place the implants. Remember they were a bit subcrestal and we just left them subcrestal. And then when the uncovery is done, she'll probably have lost a little bit of bone just from wearing the dentures and you won't have much to do. 
but I'd much rather do that bone reduction at second stage surgery than at first stage. Because if you go ahead at the time of surgery, if you're going to two stage this, if you reduce bone at the time of surgery down to the platform, and then they wear a denture, they're probably going to get some bone loss. So now you've just given the body a head start on bone loss around your implants. So don't do your bone reduction on the day of surgery. So we did that for every site, and here are our implant sizes. We had four threes by eight in the posterior first molar region, four three by 11s everywhere else. And that's the money shot. That's exactly what you want to see is that implant right in the dead center of each of those sites. And that's Dr. Carmine again, that was his very first full arch case that he'd ever done. And this took two hours, right? I think my first full arch took me like 11 hours. It was insane. Uh, and, you know, all of us just felt like we weren't worth shooting at the end of it. So very impressive job. He did an awesome uh, job on this one. And this is kind of a cool thing. Uh, I don't have a video right now of it, but I do on my YouTube channel, which is just my name in Corey Glenn. But one of the cool things you can do is if you take a post-op CT, you can pull that post-op CT into your pre-operative planning case, and you'll actually be able to compare where the implants ended up to where they had been planned for. And so that's what we did here. Now, the pan view is not going to look uh, as accurate because it's, it's a reconstruction, right? And unless you had that panoramic curve exactly the same, it's going to look a little different. But where you can really tell is when you superimpose the 3D views. So here I lowered the density so that just the implants were showing up. And so these green blobs, those are the implants themselves after being placed. And look at how they're superimposed directly on top of the planned implant positions. So there was no funny business there of me moving stuff after the fact. That's just how it ended up. And I've consistently found this to be the case. They, they're just a very accurate way to do a surgery. Okay, and that's a buckle view just showing the implant. So, you know, this is not rocket science. It's just a slight tweak in the procedure, right? The guides are all the same. It's just a matter of how you sequence it. Okay, so you're gonna, you're gonna do your flapless pin tubes, mark your implant sites on the tissue, then remove everything, make a lingualized flap, and then reseat the guide and the, the tissue on the lingual holds it, and then the pins hold it on the buckle very accurate and it's an easy, easy, easy way to do surgery. Uh, a beginner could do this case easily as far as the planning is concerned uh, with about 10 minutes of, of tutoring. It's not hard at all. All right. So with that said, uh, I just, I like to throw in pictures to remind me when I'm at the end of a case. So this is just a picture from uh, Kauai when I went a couple of years ago, beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go, I think that and Maui are my favorite Hawaiian islands. All right, so let's, uh, let's now jump up in the difficulty level. So this is what everyone's been hounding on me to, to get some videos on. So uh, that's what we're gonna show. So our lab, Transcend Digital Lab has been doing uh, surgical guides for full arches. That's kind of our, our niche area that we, we focus on mainly. Um, and we've begun doing this technique where we use a stackable system, but it's magnetically attached and it has a lot of advantages. You know, there's no pins to pull and secure components together. Everything pops on, pops off. It's just very streamlined. And so this is actually the old style of how I did them. And then at the end, I'm going to show you kind of how that has morphed and what my technique is now very similar with a couple of uh, significant, but, you know, easy changes, okay? So this is just the completed case, but let's walk through uh, doing this. So whenever I'm gonna do one of these complex cases, right? This is absolutely a full mouth rehab. There's no question about it. And so in any full mouth rehab, implants, crown and bridge, dentures, whatever the case may be, we always need to start with the end in mind. Right? If you've ever listened to me for more than about three minutes, you've heard me beat that to death. And so we, we got to start by figuring out where teeth belong. So this patient's background is he had had a crown and bridge rehab uh, less than two years ago, uh, which is why these upper teeth look really nice. Problem is he comes in for follow-up and uh, I wasn't the treating doctor, I just did planning on this, but 
radiographs showed extensive decay around the, the necks of all of those teeth, uh, kind of the apple core caries. And at some point, you know, could he have maybe restored them again? I'm sure he could have, but man, unless you just got money sitting around everywhere, not many people can afford to keep doing a full mouth rehab of Crown and Bridge every couple of years. At some point, you know, you got to realize teeth are not for everybody. And so given that in two years, this whole thing failed, it was between him and the doctor, they decided it was not worth going that route again and that implants would be a better option. And I would tend to agree with that. I find that implants do best in the patients who have lost their teeth due to decay because it's a whole different set of bugs that cause decay as opposed to periodontitis or peri-implantitis. Uh, those people I'm a little bit more concerned about jumping straight into implants, but here I think this is going to be a great option for them. So what I do first of all is I'm going to just do a quick smile analysis. So I've got this PowerPoint template. There's video about it on my YouTube channel and you can email the link that's listed in the comments and it'll send this to you but it's very simple. You can make this as well. All it is, is basically a uh, cross hatch, right? It's a, it's a vertical line, two perpendicular lines, and then two more vertical lines. And what I'll do is line the picture of the patient up behind this, where I have the uh, vertical line going through the midline of their face, right? So the, the two places I'm trying to line up are right here on the bridge of the nose and the dead middle and then down here at the filter of the lip. Okay, so once we do that, and again, I'm rotating the picture, not the lines, then that shows me now that, hey, his midline is pretty good where it's at. The other two vertical lines, I'm gonna pull out laterally to the width of his nose because that now tells me how wide to make his anterior 16th. Okay, so when I go to do the digital wax up in a moment, I'll be referencing this picture and looking back and forth. So I can see over here that, you know, these teeth are a little bit wide for him because this canine is going outside of that. And I, I think it looks a little toothy too, like that lateral looks too big to me. Um, so the issues that we found from this is that there's not enough maxillary show. You know, he's showing more mandibular teeth than he has maxillary teeth. So we'd like to correct that. Um, the occlusal plane is slanted downward to his left. So we need to fix that. His midline's good. Tooth widths are okay. I don't like the laterals, but you know we can fix that. And then we do want to fill out his buccal corridor a little bit more. All right. So one of the, the very useful pieces of, of technology that I use is a smile simulation software. There's a bunch of them out there. A lot of them work great. Uh, but the one I've kind of settled on and that I'm using the most right now is called DTS Pro. Um, highly recommend it. You know, it's one of those purchases that if you can't make your money back on that in about 10 minutes, I mean, what are you doing with your life? Because this will absolutely sell more cases than you can possibly imagine. Because, you know, it's one thing for me to tell a patient what I can accomplish for them. It's quite another to see in their own face with a photorealistic simulation what's possible. Okay, so he's not in that bad a shape to start with. So it's maybe not as drastic. But a lot of times if they've got a really bad dentition and you do a, a very high quality simulation uh, that looks photorealistic, I mean, that gets patients fired up and motivated to do the case. Okay, so when I'm doing the simulation, once again, I'm referencing back and forth to that uh, slide I'd shown earlier, this one right here. Okay, so remember we needed more maxillary show. So I brought the edges down some and these are sized appropriately. So you can see that's adding about three millimeters of incisal length and giving it some curvature, right? You want that smile line to follow the lower lip. Uh, we filled out the buccal corridor. Imagine if you drop a line straight down from its nostrils, our canines are right in line with that, just like you would choose denture teeth, right? So this, I would send to the doctor, get approval. If I'm doing the case myself, I would show it to the patient. Um, and just another quick plug on DTS Pro. I don't get anything out of them, um, but I find it so useful because the, the software is so quick. And if y'all are interested, I could even show you a case because it takes literally a minute to do one of these. Um, you can do these simulations in one to two minutes. You could train an assistant, a hygienist, anyone to do this. So your hygienist is always waiting longer than that for you to come check, right? 
man, put them to use doing something productive. Just have them take a quick cell phone picture and do a simulation on everybody. And if there's any interest there whatsoever, then, you know, you could move on to a wax up. Uh, so I find it's most useful if it's a female patient, just to print it out right then and there or email it to them. If it's a male patient, you, you email it to their wife because they just don't care, right? The wife is who's going to tell them to, to do the case or not. So with all that in mind, I know from the smile simulation what the problems are. I know from the simulation uh, what I could do to fix it. And now I'm going to go into Blue Sky Plan and import all this data. So here you can see I've got the comb beam open. I've stitched in his upper and lower uh, intraoral scans. I've also pulled in his facial picture and superimposed it on there. Uh, a lot of people are unaware of that, but you see this little head button in the 3D window. Uh, you can pull in their full face picture and align that. Now it's a bit clunky to align and me and Michael are gonna work on that, but you can do it. And it's very useful because now you can kind of see your simulation or your wax up in their face. Uh, so I pull all that in and now I'm going to go to the denture module and do the wax up. So when I'm doing the wax up, I'm going to be constantly referencing back and forth between his simulation and uh, his existing. And I'm going to just make notes of it. So one of the cool things you can do with that simulation is you can turn the transparency down about 50% so that I can still see my simulation, but then I can also see the real tooth positions underneath it. And so that tells me exactly how I need to position teeth in my digital wax up. So if I looked over and I said, okay, so the number nine, I've got two millimeters longer, then I come over and I put my number nine of my digital wax up, two millimeters longer, and just so forth with every tooth. Uh, correct any of the deficiencies that they had, and you can have a wax up done very quickly. And then I will turn that wax up into a denture. Now it's not a full contour denture. It is just a, uh, basically a horseshoe denture. But this is what will eventually become the immediate load prosthetic. Okay, so I've got that upper and lower. And now that I know where teeth belong, right? We're starting from the end in mind. Since I know where the teeth belong, now I'm gonna plan my implants backwards. And I'm gonna find the ideal compromise between that prosthetic tooth position and the available bone, okay? Uh, so this is just a, a picture showing, I don't have his full face shown here, but this blue represents his true inner pupillary line. And you can see that the uh, occlusal plane of his existing dentition has this sloping cant. And then if I turn the transparency up on the picture, now notice my uh, occlusal plane. If I zoom in here, you can see this green line is the new occlusal plane. So we've corrected that with our temps. We know that this is gonna look better on them. So now we plan implant positions. So we were able to get six implants per arch, always trying to maximize as much AP spread as I can get. Um, and then also you've gotta be mindful about how much prosthetic space do you need? So that's where it's nice to have already positioned the teeth because I can simply use the measuring tool go from incisal edge back 15 to 17 millimeters, and that's how deep my implants need to go. And so when I did that, you can see here, I'm a good eight, nine millimeters subcrestal, which automatically to me means bone reduction. It would not be wise to go ahead and do like a soft tissue guide and drill through nine millimeters of bone before you even get to the platform of where that implant's gonna go. One, you won't have drills long enough to do it. Secondly, even if you did, the wag factor is just way too much. So plan these, we're coming lingual to incisal edges or through occlusal surfaces. And, you know, I, I was excited initially because I saw, man, he's got quite a bit of posterior bone. That's pretty rare. However, when I actually put the implants deep enough that I had adequate prosthetic space, now it becomes evident that, you know, once the bone reduction is done, he's only going to have two millimeters of vertical space until I'm in the sinus. So again, this is where planning becomes very critical. If you just slammed in a bunch of implants and then try to make it work at the end, how do you overcome that? You know, you either have to go FP1, which is a lot more difficult, or you've just got to crank their vertical open and give them excessive teeth or you make your restoration too small and it breaks all the time. None of those are good options. So 
easy to avoid if we just plan on the front end. That's the entire value of guided surgery. So this is just showing the prosthetic space. Uh, the measuring tool is this little ruler icon that you see right here at the top of the screen where my mouse is. And so once I know where the ideal teeth are, I'll measure from incisal edge or occlusal surface. I usually go from the functional cusp and go backwards 15 to 17 millimeters. So you can see just where I placed these to get everything on an even plane. This particular one ended up 18, which means I have tons of space. This one is just shy of 15, it's 14.84. We can work with that, that's not the end of the world. Uh, and here is the plane of reduction on these. So when I do my plane of reduction, I usually still try to leave the implants one to two millimeters subcrestal. So this is my original magnetic guide design. Okay, so a couple things to note, it's, it's a buckle only. The fit is 100% anatomic, which is important because there are, uh, there are products out there that their patents specify a non-anatomic design. And that, that's a disclaimer I should mention right now. If you are gonna jump into doing these full arch stackable type guides, you need to be aware of the various patents that are out there in this space so that you can avoid uh, impinging on those patents. Um, so I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to be advising you on what that entails, but let me just tell you, I've done an immense amount of research to intentionally avoid impinging on those designs. And there's a bunch of them out there. So uh, just look around. It might even be worth having a patent lawyer look at whatever your proposed design is to verify that you think it's going to be uh, all good. So this is the reduction guide. Uh, this one in particular has five pins, right? I try to get as many pins in as possible. It's better to have more than you need than less because when there's existing teeth in a case, you never know if you're going to blow out one of these buckle walls. And if that's where a pin was, now that pin is useless. So you want to have some extras if at all possible. And then uh, as far as how the components stack together, right? So I, I did this before with just magnets, but the problem is you can overcome that magnetic force and slide them off of one another if you're drilling really hard and in hard mode, you will. So I found that I needed to have some actual indexing uh, pegs, you use pegs or whatever method that you want, but it's a male female component. So these holes, one, two, three, those are where a male pin on the stackable component is going to penetrate in and kind of lock that in place laterally. And then these other four sites are for magnets. So I'm using three millimeter by three millimeter magnets, and those are purely just for retention. That keeps it all stable. If you think about a maxillary arch, if all you've got is this, then you're gonna to have to sit there and hold that on because gravity's working against you. It's gonna to wanna to fall off. With the magnets, you don't have to worry about that. Everything's going to be in place uh, and it should be very easy to use. So I usually will put my distal most uh, indexing peg even with my most distal implant. Okay, so uh, here, here, here. And then the magnets, I just kind of intersperse between those. I usually shoot for about four magnets. And I get these from Apex Magnets. Um, they're very affordable. It's about 10 bucks for 50 of them. So, you know, you end up using 12 or 16 per case, but who cares? But they're virtually free. So uh, it's no, not a problem. And this is the drill design, drill guide design, and the stackable prosthetic would be similar. So you see the male pin that indexes into these holes, and then the uh, opposing magnet holder. And then this is just like a guide bar, right? It's just interconnected at each of these. My video I'll show a little later is going to show you how uh, I make those connections. And then, you know, there's, there's a need to initially drill your pinholes, right? So this is a tooth positioning guide. And once again, it's just magnetically attached. And this would index that reduction guide into place. And then you drill your pinholes pin it into place and then you could remove this. Now, I will say I have changed this design. I no longer do this and I, I prefer the new method, which I'm gonna show more towards the end. But again, I'm just showing you cases of how we've done it uh, in the past. So you would 
index the bone reduction guide into place, drill your pinholes, pin it in, and then pop off that guide. And now that leaves you behind this. So you can now do your extractions. Um, you know, I've heard various opinions. Some people don't like having this in place when they're doing their extractions. Other people like it and say it helps protect the buckle plate from breaking. I don't care either way, whatever. Um, either one works. And then one of the difficulties in planning these cases is you just got so much hardware in each jaw, right? So you've got four to six implants, and then you've got maybe up to five pins, and there's existing roots there. So you're trying to avoid all these things. So uh, notice here that I have all of the individual teeth segmented, and that's extremely helpful in that perspective at avoiding those, those tooth roots. Because again, if I've got a pin and it's going through the apex of this root, well, if I now drill that and then pin it, I've got a pin going all the way through the tooth. So how am I going to extract that? I'd have to pull that pin out or I'd have to preemptively pull that tooth before I drill that pinhole, neither of which I really love. Occasionally it's unavoidable, but I try if at all possible to avoid those. And so uh, this is everything positioned relative to the teeth. And once that's in place, now you pull all the teeth and do your bone reduction. So you're just reducing the bone down to the level of this uh, metal reduction guide. Now materials uh, are just up to you. It doesn't matter what material you use. The, the main thing you're after is it just needs to be strong. So we've been primarily either milling or 3D printing titanium um, or chrome cobalt. Both of them are great options. Uh, the printing metal is a bit pricey. So, and you're probably not gonna be able to afford a metal printer because they're about $300,000. So uh, we've been outsourcing that to a couple of different places, but uh, I've come up with some methods also of how to mill this. If you're into milling and want to geek out on that, you have a mill that can do full arch type stuff. You know, we can maybe discuss that uh, at a later time, but we could do this in zirconia if you're milling it. Uh, you could do this in peak. You could do this in pecton. You could do this in PMMA. Um, again, materials are irrelevant, right? You're, you just want something strong enough that you don't have to make super thick because part of the advantage of this design is it's so low profile. It minimizes how much flap reflection we've got to do. So metal is obviously great, but uh, another option that I've been playing with is there are now really affordable peak printers that will print peak, but they're FDM style printers, which are like the filament printers that work more like a hot glue gun and extrude. Um, they're about $5,000 or so to get a, a printer that does peak. Uh, they're not going to be your standard hobby printers because peak has to be heated a, a good bit more than PLA or any of those type filaments. So that's an option that would be a lot cheaper than a mill or a metal printer if you wanted to consider it because peak is super strong. Uh, but again, materials doesn't matter. Use whatever you want. At the end of the day, you're just designing STL files and then what you fabricate them out of is up to you. So this is after the bone reduction has been done and we've just taken it down to the level of this reduction guide. Once that has been done, now the magnetic drill guide will stack on top. And again, you would line the little male female pegs and then the magnets would pull it home and keep it there so that you don't have to worry about movement during your surgery. And then finally, you would have your immediate load prosthesis. So remember, we designed this at the very beginning of the case uh, as part of the smile design for him. And so with these, again, you've got the option to mill them. And oftentimes, we'll mill them in PMMA because it's not a complex shape to mill if you've got a five axis. Uh, but more often, we use uh, printed materials. And so I've got a few go-tos. Uh, you know, there's now multiple materials that are approved for permanent crowns and bridges by FDA. They are not technically approved for full arch hybrids. So this is a bit of an off-label use. But having said that, they have performed extremely well. Uh, I don't think I've yet had one of these break that was a hybrid design where I had the proper dimensions. Uh, there's two cases that come to mind that I've seen these materials break on a full arch. One was an FP1 where they're just more prone to break because you've got thin connectors at each tooth. The other was a hybrid where we only had like 12 millimeters restorative space 
that's all the doc could get. He didn't want to do more. So we just kind of had to make do with it. And in the final, we can put metal bars or substructures and deal with that. But in the temp phase, unless you do a metal reinforced temp, that's a bit more problematic. I swear it was so quiet when I came out here on my back porch. And now it sounds like I'm in Ukraine about to be bombed. I've got the neighbor blowing leaves and tilling his garden and airplanes. So my apologies if, if uh, there's too much noise. Hopefully it'll calm down soon. Uh, so here's the prosthesis. A couple things to note about it. Notice it is already designed to be fully ovate or flat, right? You want this thing to be cleansable and you're going to use this. I, I call it a full arch healing abutment, right? This is what's going to train your tissue. So if you want your final to end up being cleansable and not ridge lapped, then the prosthesis you deliver on the day of surgery needs to have that shape because the tissue is going to conform to whatever it is you put in there. So the way I design these, I'll put them exactly three millimeters off of the, the level of the reduced jaw. We found that to be the, about the ideal uh, amount of space to give uh, you know, good tissue quality without having it all red and inflamed from being too close to the bone. Uh, but it's already over eight, it's three millimeters off the bone. And the cool thing is, unlike a traditional pickup where you're having to close them in, they might be sedated and you're trying to manipulate their jaws together and get occlusion lined up. You don't worry about that here because everything is indexed off the guides. So as long as that guide was placed properly, everything else is going to end up in the right position. So it's a much cleaner workflow for your prosthetic pickup. Now, this is a, a unique thing that I do. And in my videos I've got of how I do this at the end, I, I made an amazing video of this and the computer ate it. I didn't realize it until right before this. So I could maybe, if there's time, show you just in real time how to do it. But this, I've gotten more feedback on than anything else about our guides is how much easier the prosthetic pickup is because there's a, a uniform path of draw built in over all of the temp cylinders. So if these things look familiar here, these are the MMUTC temp cylinders that go on top of multis that Blue Sky sells. Uh, these would be what you would pick up in a restoration, right? Well, I can virtually stick those onto the implants in the software. But what I'll do is I'll export all of those abutments and just mount them to a flat plane. I just do that in Mesh Mixer or whatever software and then pull it right back into Blue Sky Plan. And then I'm going to create a path of draw over that. Now, you can do that either in surgical guide module or I usually do it in the denture module. I'll trick the software to make it think I'm making a denture, but really all I'm after is that step one of the denture process, which is to block out undercuts. So with that done, now my undercuts are blocked out. So when we go to do the prosthetic pickup, you know, your cylinders are not all parallel. You've got some facing anteriorly, some maybe a little posteriorly. The inclinations of the maxilla especially deviates from side to side with the bone. And so if you haven't built in a path of draw, you're going to end up almost having to pick up one or two cylinders at a time because otherwise it's just not going to seat over them all. With this, if as long as you build in this path of draw, you're going to be able to seat this over all of your cylinders simultaneously and pick them up all at once, which saves a ton of time, makes it much easier. And this is how it should look, right? So you've got, I usually make this hole about five millimeters in diameter along with the path of draw, which gives you room to uh, either salt and pepper acrylic from the occlusal aspect or what I prefer, I just leave it up to doctors, but my preference is to actually make about a two millimeter uh, channel, like a, a tunnel from the buckle. So usually up in the buckle gingiva where the doctor can just fill a syringe with quick set acrylic and just inject it in through that hole and it's going to uniformly fill all around that cylinder. I find that with doing that, you get a much denser fill of acrylic. Um, you end up with a lot less cleanup to do. It's, it's just better overall. And so you would inject all your acrylic in and then just wait it out, let it set up. As soon as that acrylic hardens, now you can undo the screws on your multi-unit cylinders and this will all come out only now your multi-unit cylinders are embedded into that temporary. And then at that point, if you've got any excess chimney height, you just cut that off at the high speed. Uh, that's one thing I would mention to you. 
that I had to learn the hard way. But when you start cutting off excess chimney height, you need to do that with a high speed handpiece and a carbide burr with water. Because if you go and try to just grind on metal in the lab with a lab handpiece, right, it's going to get hot. Well, acrylic is thermoplastic. So what I found is I did that a few times and then took it back to the mouth. Things don't fit anymore. And we finally figured out the problem that acrylic was heating up and my cylinder was getting moved a little bit. And then when it cooled down, it hardened there. So we had to drill them out and do a new pickup. That's no fun. Wouldn't recommend it. So uh, use a high speed with water when you're adjusting these cylinder heights. Uh, if you are doing your own case and you know whose prosthetics you're going to pick up, you can actually pre-trim these so that they're going to come exactly to the height of the restoration, but not beyond that. So that's a great option. But uh, however you choose to do the pickup, regardless, you'll be able to pick them up all at once. And then when it hardens, take this out. And the only cleanup work or conversion per se to do is to now just cut off those little magnet feet and the little pin index system. Those come right off with the high speed handpiece and leaves behind a nice finished surface. You don't have to trim it up and reshape the underside to get a cleansable intaglio. It's all done already. So uh, that's a really worthwhile thing to do if you're going to do these types of cases. All right, here's just a lingual view uh, where you can see that three millimeters of space underneath the, uh, the hybrid between the bone and the hybrid. And again, no ridge laps, no concave areas on the intaglio. It's all designed. And again, if you do this properly, then you don't have to have a bite in occlusion and check it and all that. You should just be able to pick up the upper, do your lower surgery, pick up the lower. And then at the very end, they should bite down into an almost ideal bite with very little uh, occlusal adjustments. And just, to, I meant to say this earlier when I was talking about the, uh, the 3D printed resins, but there's four that I've been using that have all performed extremely well. Uh, Onyx from Sprint Ray has done really well. Uh, it's a highly ceramic filled resin that you can print on the Sprint Ray printer. Uh, we've used a lot of the uh, Envision Tech uh, Flexera Smile. Um, that has worked really well. Uh, we have used Bigo Varseo Crown, and all three of those, if I'm not mistaken, are FDA approved for permanent crown and bridge. And then the newest one on the block that just got their FDA, but that I've been playing with a while, is from Cer excuse me, Ceramco. And I'm blanking right now the exact resin name, but if you look up Ceramco, you can find which one is their permanent crown and bridge resin. All of those resins are pricier than your normal model resin, but they also go a long way. I find that usually to print one of these full arch prosthetics takes about 12 to 15 milliliters of resin. Um, you know, the most expensive of those resins is about 1200 a liter, but if you're only using 12 milliliters of it, that probably equates to 12 to $15 on the highest end. And then on the lower end, maybe seven or $8. So minimal expense. If I was you, I'd just get a one as my only shade. And then, you know, if you need brighter than that, tough luck, you'll get it in the finals. If you need darker than that, it's easy to stain down with uh, uh, the GC Optiglaze stains. So this is everything printed out. So you've got your tooth indexed uh, positioning guide. Again, I've gone away from this particular method in favor of something else that I'll show you. Uh, but here, this is just printed in surgical guide resin. All of these were done on the Sprint Ray Pro 95. Um, the metal guides, this particular case was printed by Oral Arts in Huntsville. Who has a, they have an SLM printer and do chrome cobalt. They do a nice job. Um, here is after you remove that indexing guide, right? So that's that's used to position it where you can drill your pinholes. Now you pin it into place and you can take that off. It just magnetically detaches. Now do your extractions, okay? After extractions, you can do the bone reduction down to the level of your reduction guide. And I, I do like metal in this regard because you're inevitably gonna beat that up a little bit with your burr and the metal just holds up phenomenally well to that. So these are my reduced jaws and then the stackable drill guide. So the drill guide goes on, magnetically attaches. It's got the three male, female pins, uh, it's super stable. Um, 
again, one of the key components for that to be stable is that you need to have your, your last male female indexing pin at least even with, if not a little bit distal to your back implants. Uh, so I do it, three of them. I do a tripod, one as far anterior as possible, and then the back to even with the implant. And so the implants would then go into place. You can fully guide everything, and then you can deliver your prosthesis. This particular one was done in Flexera Smile, because that's the shade uh, that we had A1 in at the time. And one thing I'll mention, regardless of the resin that you use, is this is one of the occasions where I might consider printing at 50 micron resolution as opposed to 100. Accuracy wise, I don't find a difference, to be quite honest with you. But the layer lines are going to be double the size in something that's printed at 100 microns. So if you're trying to get a really smooth finish to your hybrid, well, printing at 50 microns is going to make those layer lines almost disappear. We just you almost can't see them. Uh, and then if you need to stain the teeth, you know, that's one thing that can make it look a little more realistic is if you put some light staining around the cervical to give it some color depth. And then this particular case, we just did uh, uh, GC uh, staining on the gingiva. Um, for the gingiva, I don't love the GC Optoglaze. I would look at the Taub Elixirs, T-A-U-B. Uh, Jordan Taub, I think, is the go-to man on that. Those work great. They seem to do a better job of getting coverage um, with fewer coats. But more recently, what I've been doing is not staining at all and actually just make a 3D printed gingival skin that I can bond on after the fact. And the advantage to that is that, you know, at the end of this case, I've got to cut these little indexes off. And if this is all monolithic, then when I do that, I'm left behind with a white spot that's either just going to be left there or that I've got to restain. If I do a printed gingival skin, then it's got some actual depth to the pink material. So when you cut that off, you're still left with the pink surface. So that's kind of my preferred method. It's case dependent, which one I'll do. Uh, both do work really well, um, but this is the final hybrid. So that's how everything stacked up. As far as dimensions on these guides, I'm usually making them about three millimeters thick buckle to lingual. And then this one was four millimeters vertically. I'm more, more often doing three and a half, but again, it's, it's a very small dimension. So much less aggressive flat than some of the just resin printed guides I've done in the past, uh, which obviously is a big advantage if you're not a oral surgeon doing sedation and, you know, having someone knocked out. The less your flap is, the easier it is for everybody. Uh, and again, notice it's fully anatomic right against the bone. So I like that as opposed to floating off the bone because it gives it a definitive fit, right? If you look at it and it's not perfectly flush everywhere, well, that's a red flag that something isn't lined up and that you need to go back and you know, make sure your stuff was positioned properly or that you didn't have uh, movement or something in your CT scan. This is just a visual check and it gives it some more stability being flush on the bone. Uh, so just again, the digital design in blue sky to the printed reality. Uh, there you see all of it. And then here's the actual surgery. So this was done by a friend of mine, Dr. Ford Gatkins in uh, the Nashville area. Uh, he was actually a couple of years ahead of me in school and uh, we did the same residency. So kind of know his background, it's fun to work with him. But uh, when you do this clinically, you're gonna go ahead and raise a buckle flap. Okay, you don't have to do any on the lingual, but you do have to raise a buckle flap at least as high as the bottom of your reduction guide and then no need to go beyond that but remember this metal guide is designed to fit flush on the bone so if there's tissue there this is not going to go to place so raise your buckle flap seat it drill each of your pinholes and pin it into place like you see here and then now you can do your extractions again this is going to differ from my more recent design i've been doing and uh you know, I posted this case online and got beat up on it by everyone saying, oh, those are perfectly good teeth. This is criminal, whatever. Yeah, I mean, it was a two-year-old two full mouth rehab, so it looks great from here. But when you start looking at x-rays, it's a different story. Again, you can see a little bit of it, all the decay around the margins. 
this was failing. So believe it or not, you know, this is the situation. So these teeth are now gonna come out and then you can do bone reduction. So just take a big E cutter burr or one of those nail head burrs in a high speed. I like those as well, or a big Lindemann. Uh, I like to do a Lindemann and just kind of lay it sideways and mow this down, staying just above the reduction guide. And then I'll get one of those uh, nail head drills or, or burrs in a high speed hand piece and go back and now refine it down to dead even with the reduction guide. Um, that's what I find to be the easiest, but you know, lots of tools work for this, it's up to you. So once the reduction is done, now the drill guide goes on. So this was for the Blue Sky Fully Guided Kit. So you're gonna, again, be strategic with using your drill every site that you can prior to moving to the next one, right? So bone profiler on every site, and then two by eight, or two by six, and then two and a half by eight, right? Do them everywhere uh, to maximize your efficiency. And then the implants were fully guided into place. These were uh, the Blue Sky Biomax. These might have been the Forte implants. I don't quite remember. Uh, but for those of you that uh, you know do a lot of immediate load cases or just immediate implants in general, really you ought to look at that Forte implant. It's an excellent implant. Uh, I'm obviously not doing surgery anymore, but my partners are doing a lot of surgery, and I work with a lot of docs that do it. So. The Forte has very, very wide aggressive threads that really cut their way in. Uh, you know, you can just do a 4.3 osteotomy and then place a seven millimeter implant into it because it's the core is 4.3, but then those big sharp threads are just cutting their way in and you get some crazy wicked stability, uh, but without having excessive torque. Again, those threads are super wide, but they're razor sharp and narrow. So they, seem to cut in really well without having an excessive osteotomy. All right, so implants are in place. Uh, this would be the time to go ahead and add some graft into your buckle gaps and all of that. And then you can put on your temp cylinders. So these are those MMUTC cylinders. Uh, these are the multi-units in place, obviously, and you can see the graft in place. I would suggest place your graft before you stick on your, your uh, uh, multis because if you get bone chips down there, it's going to be tough to seat these. So graft, place multis, place your temp cylinders, and now you can do your pickup. So you'll notice here that he's got a piece of rubber dam underneath it. Um, that's a good idea to just, you know, mark some holes uh, to punch on your rubber dam and punch them over each cylinder and just push it down to basically where that, that multi-cylinder starts to flare because that's going to be so deep subgingival anyway that it's not going to get uh, picked up in the initial pickup. What you're trying to do is you're trying to limit the ability of the acrylic to escape around uh, that cylinder and get across under the, uh, the edge where it kind of becomes concave because that's when you can start having to worry about having a lock on. And that's a mistake you only make once in your career. It's not a fun day. Uh, that's out of order, but that was his pre-op condition. And then here's the lower arch, this uh, similar process, right? This guide goes in, pin holes, pin it in place, bone reduction, drill guide. There's the reduced jaw. And then place your multis on, place your temp cylinders. And then the temp, if you built in that path of draw, should drop over all of those simultaneously. And this case, uh, the pickup was done from the occlusal. But again, my preference is to actually have a, a small two millimeter channel through the buckle so that I can just fill a syringe up with acrylic, inject it, and I get a denser fill and it's a lot easier access from my perspective. And then as far as the closure, um, you know, this is something uh, myself and Danny Doming wrote an article about a while back. Uh, I think it was called like the full arch healing abutment. But again, the idea is if you think about a single tooth implant, right? Well, you have a healing abutment that you're going to put on at second stage or first stage surgery, right? That has an ideal emergence contour. And the idea is that you're just, you know, you can't get primary closure. You're just going to snug the tissue up to that 
And as it heals, it's going to conform and take the shape of that healing abutment to give you a nice emergence. Well, this is just the same thing applied across a full arch. So if you have ideal contours, three millimeters off the bone, no concavities, good emergence, all of that, and then you just suture the tissue to the temp. You're not trying to get primary closure. You're pulling the tissue edges to the temp. And then the tissue is going to assume the shape of that temp. So if you've designed that properly, you're going to end up with a really, really nice tissue emergence. And the additional benefit is that because you're not pulling the flat edges all the way together, you're actually pulling them to the temp. And then you probably got an eight millimeter space between flap edges. Well, if both sides of your incision were in keratinized gingiva, that's going to all fill in with keratinized gingiva. So you can actually take a three millimeter band of keratinized tissue and turn it into a 10 millimeter band just by your suture design. It's super, super easy, drastically easier than doing soft tissue grafting or anything like that. And all it costs you is a suture. And it's actually easier than, than doing a bunch of individual sutures trying to get primary closure. Uh, you know, Danny, when he does these cases, is usually doing two sutures, three at the most. And it's just a big horizontal mattress with a two or three tooth wide bite. Uh, he'll do one on this side, one on this side. And that everts the tissue edges up to the temp. And then he'll only place one in the midline if when they move the tongue, this is moving. And so in that case, he'd get another two or three tooth bite. Uh, and do it, tie it off on the buckle so their tongue doesn't play with it and irritate it. And if you can, one other good option is to use PRF. I've just seen the tissue healing when you use PRF to be so much better. Uh, and two, it helps occupy that dead space between the underside of the restoration and the bone. It protects that to some degree. And it's just giving the body a big head start on getting, uh, you know, tissue fill in there, right? Because if you have a wound, first thing your body does is form a scat, which is just a big fibrin clot. Well, here we're giving it a head start. We usually try to do two uh, PRF slugs per implant. And so that would be 12 in this case. And, uh, you know, punch a hole in the center of it and just poncho it over your uh, temps. I'm sorry, your temp cylinders. Okay, so uh, Dr. Gatkin did that here. And then before you suture, right, you've done your pickup and we're assuming that now someone or yourself has gone and cut off those indexing feet and now it's ready to deliver. Deliver that temp and fully torque it down before you do any suturing, right? That's extremely important if you're gonna do it by this method, which has worked very well for us. So. Uh, deliver the temp, then suture the tissue to it with two or three sutures, big horizontal mattress, and it's super easy to do, and the results are phenomenal. You know, I've, Danny might have sold his soul to the devil. I've seen that guy grow, uh, you know, keratinized tissue from, from dirt, but uh, it's pretty amazing what you can simply do just with incision design and suture design. So uh, it doesn't look the prettiest. Now, this is pre-suturing. But even after you suture, it looks a little rough on the first few days because the edges are uneven and whatnot, right? You had teeth in there and now those little floppy peaks of tissue are up against the temp. Just explain that to the patient, say this is gonna look ugly for a few days, but this is gonna give us a much better tissue uh, result. And it does, I mean, within a week, two weeks, it's gonna look amazing. And when you finally remove this after healing, you're gonna have such a big band of keratinized gingiva. Uh, it's just really impressive. You can actually see in this picture what I was talking about. Because this was purely done with gingival stain, notice the white spots and I don't think they had any gingival stain there. So it wasn't a big issue. It's below the lip line, but again, this is why I like doing the gingival skin more often these days. Uh, Michael, any questions or anything while I'm yeah, there are a bunch of questions that came in. If you want to pull them up on your Q&A or take a look okay. at the chat. All right. How do you clean up the scatter before you start planting? Unfortunately, you can't. So scatter is inherent to cone beam technology. There's no way to reduce it. Um, now, the various cone beam companies, their softwares oftentimes will have algorithms that reduce it 
but that's all computer stuff. That's not, it's not getting rid of the scatter. It's just got an algorithm that helps make it not so apparent. So you can't avoid it, which means that if a patient uh, has tons of restorations of gold, metal, zirconia, any of those things, then know that before you scan them. And if they've got that to start with, then you need to do one of two things. You either need to do a scan appliance. Okay, so a scan appliance, uh, the way I do it is I will take, and I think I've shown this on a previous webinar, but I'll take a plastic impression tray and I'll use medium body PBS and I'll do an impression of the arch to be worked on. And then I'll take that out once it sets up. I'll cut off all the little interproximal tags because we're going to have to reinsert it. And then cut off all the excess that has flown out the nooks and crannies of the tray. And now, just like in a dual scan, I'm going to put radiographic markers on that plastic tray, pop it back in the mouth, and now run them to the machine or do it at the machine. Cone beam scan them with that impression, fully seated with radiographic markers, then take it out and scan that impression by itself. And it's going to be the exact same process as the dual scan with the denture, only in this case, you're not doing it for that reason. You're doing it because the teeth are going to obscure and not be able to stitch. So in this scenario, when you do this, you're not using the teeth anymore as your stitching points. You're using those radiographic markers, which are out and away from that scatter. So that works extremely well. The other alternative uh, that can work well too, but it's a bit more, it's a, bit more learning curve in the software to figure it out is to do what I was talking about where you pack them full of cotton because you know even if the teeth are going to get obscured if you create some air space around the tissue then that that space is going to show up as really dark black and you can see now tissue contours so you can actually do manual alignment until you can match up all those tissue contours and that can work really well uh, please make a video of how you made the bite dentures to aid placing stabilization pins. I will try my best to do that. Uh, I'll have to go back and find that case, but yeah, I'll, I'll try to do that. The smile template, uh, let, me, let me actually just show you this real quick because this is the easiest way to get it. If you just go to my YouTube channel, All right, and then under videos, you can see easy and free smile simulations. Hey, what's up? This is uh, that video. And if you come down here, you can see if you'd like a copy of the template, click right here. And that's all automated because if you're going to depend on me to do it through email, good luck. My email's a black hole that I've never seen anything in. Uh, all right, let's pull this up. Uh, so yeah, Dr. Hill, uh, just do that. That'll be the easiest way to get it. I find Lab Pronto's costing template for a guide to be cumbersome is Transcend similar. Uh, you know, Lab Pronto's honestly got about the best pricing that's out there for surgical guides. Um, with our guides, we're going to be comparable on most stuff except for the full arch uh, stackable guide. So that's not a service offered through Lab Pronto. Uh, I don't think. Are we, do we offer that through Lab Pronto, Michael? I can't even remember. Yeah, I think we do actually okay. have that. Okay, so so yeah, the, and I'll just be upfront with it. There, our cost for the stackable system is 3,800. Uh, that's not cheap, right? But once you do a few of these and you see how long it takes, you, you kind of understand why, but it can drastically make your, your surgeries easier, more accurate, faster, all of that stuff um you know and we can we do it all right i mean that's one thing i'll say about it is we do the full smile design we do the simulation the wax up everything is prosthetically driven and it's with our lab it's all planned by doctors which i think is a big selling point uh you know i know there's a bunch of other services out there that do full arch stackable type guides that run upwards of seven eight thousand dollars an arch so that just gives you a little perspective on that um, but yeah, those cases are a lot of work, so you, you got to charge appropriately for them. How do you manage the excess soft tissue after the bone reduction? You don't. You pull that up to the tissue or to the temp and let it roll. And that's going to uh, eventually, you know, embed itself back down against the bone. And, you know, you can't ever end up with too much keratinized tissue, right? That's, that's crazy. So you want that. 
And if you've got, I've never seen where I had so much excess tissue that it was a problem. Again, just suture that to the temp and it's going to recess back and give you appropriate tissue contours after the fact. Uh, would you recommend a 3D printed prosthesis for an FP1 case for immediate load? Is what is the connector size you recommend? So yeah, I mean, I would recommend it. I've done a bunch of those. I just happened to have this case pulled up uh, in my SD card, but this is a case doing just that. Uh, well, hang on, let me, let me open this in a different program. Um, but yeah, that inherently, you're, it's gonna be weaker on FP1 because the connector size is just simply smaller. So I would try to get a good, you know, nine, 10 millimeter connector um, you don't want to overdo your connector on the buckle, but man, you can really overdo it on the lingual and, uh, bulk that out. And I'll make my temps excessively bulky on the lingual with an FP1 just to get them through the temporization phase. Um, you know, if you've got access to a five axis mill, you could even do your FP1 temps in zirconia or something like that. If you're really worried about it breaking. What I found to be the strongest for FP1 temps, short of doing like zirconia, is to do um, milled PMMA. So we have five axis mill, we'll just mill these in PMMA. Uh, so this was a case where we did serial extractions, right? These are the teeth after, or I'm sorry. Uh, all right, so in this case, these teeth were pulled and our implant sites are here, 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 here. And so these teeth were strategically pulled, leaving these behind, which allows you to now do a standard tooth supported guide for an FP1. And you would do your implant placement through this. And then once those are in place, what we chose to do in this case is to not immediate load the implants because I had pretty good spacing of these teeth. So why not just make a crown and bridge supported attempt? And so here, these teeth were just prepped after uh, after the implants were in place and we made temps ahead of time like this. So this one looks like it's a 3D printed one, uh, if I'm not mistaken. We might've made them both, a PMMA and a printed. But, you know, I love doing cases this way because you can develop the conic forms to go uh, down into the tissue of the extraction sockets and you can really train that tissue to where these things look like they're emerging out of the the tissue like normal teeth um, and then the challenge is always how do you index that into position ideally because here you don't have like a base frame reduction guide so one trick that you can use is you can do a palatal index like this that you know allows you to do your pickup and then after the pickup you just cut these connectors off and that falls away um, this is how that looked from the buckle so again you can notice here I know where the extraction sockets are going to end up, so I can build my tonic forms down into that. And you just end up getting a really nice tissue contour. So this one is actually PMMA. I can tell from the finish of it. Uh, this other one, where was it? This one was printed, but this was done at 100 microns, so it's not the glossiest finish. This one is milled PMMA straight out of the mill. And, and if you've got a five axis mill, which I highly recommend. Uh, I would suggest get the uh, 5X, uh, 5X400 from Axis Dental Solutions. I think that mill is the best bang for the buck in dentistry, hands down. Uh, it's you know $40,000 and it literally does everything except metal bars. It will do custom milled abutments, metal abutments. It will do full arch zirconia, full arch PMMA, wax, Emax, whatever you can think of. And it's much stronger than a little desktop, uh, you know, in-house ground machine, um, far more capabilities and it's way cheaper. <laughs> so I, I literally don't see a downside to it. It's so much better in every respect from the common uh, same day dentistry systems that are out there. Okay. Uh, this was another case, right? I, I had a little rash of these all at once. So this one, I think the doc did this case today. I hadn't heard how it went yet, but similar scenario only here, instead of using the tooth roots that have been prepped, he's going to pick it up on implants. So when the implants go in place, then uh, the temp cylinders will emerge through here and he can simply do a pickup again, palatal index to position it. 
and you can see how the pontic forms are going to be. Now, this model does not have the tissue on it, so that's why you can see this gap. But the pontic forms are developed to be exactly one and a half to two millimeters from the socket contours. So, again, your tissue heals and it looks like these are coming out of the tissue. Um, all right, the other questions. Uh, if you're placing implant six to eight millimeters subcrestal, do you need to reduce the lingual gingiva and suture to the height of the bone versus having a ton of floppy tissue? If you've got a lot of excessive tissue, then yeah, it's not a bad idea to throw in a midline suture just to retract it. Uh, a lot of times what we'll do is when we're making that horizontal reduction cut, we'll make it, you know, 80% of the way through. And then once we've made the cut, then you can just take an elevator and pop it and that whole bone chunk will fall away and it just pulls away from the periosteum of the lingual. Uh, that's an option as well. Um, question a little off topic, how do you manage anesthesia so that it acts sufficiently throughout the procedure? Well, interesting you say that. Um, first of all, use the right anesthetics, get away from uh, septicane. Septicane is great when you're doing fillings. It's terrible for full arch because it's not very long acting. And yeah, you'll get real profound anesthesia for about an hour, but these things go on much longer than that. So uh, I would suggest that you use lidocaine with uh, one to 100,000 epi along with marcaine. All right. So if I'm going to do a full arch, then let's say if I'm starting on the uh, mandible, which I would, so that I don't have the maxilla bleeding down on me while I'm trying to work on it, I'd do a block with uh, one Lido and one Marcane on each side. And that should have them numb as a rock for most of the rest of the day. And then as you're getting near the end of the mandibular procedure, do the same with uh, the maxilla. And there I will try it when I can to do a V2 block. And uh, one of the cool aspects that you can do with the V2 block is something I just posted on the YouTube channel the other day. And let me turn the volume down here. But here, this is more of our new guide design. But what I was going to show you is it can be difficult to find that uh, palatal foramen for the V2 block. But hey, we're doing guided surgery here. So why don't I just make a needle guide? So you can easily make out that palatal foramen in your comb beam. And you can just stick a guide tube there, right? I'll make a guide tube and just make the hole opening like a quarter of, or I'm sorry, a half a millimeter or something and position it so that when I run my needle through that, it's going to put me right in that foramen. I'll track all the way up, hub out, and then inject a full carpule. Again, a markup, marcaine and a lidocaine, 2% solution. So you can give more anesthetic if you need to. And then, uh, you know, you can do some buccal infiltration as well, but usually I find they are super, super numb when I do that. I mean, they're numb up to their eyeballs and for a long time. Uh, but this is a great option for giving that B2 block. You know, maybe it's a little gimmicky, whatever. I mean, I, I don't mind gimmicky. If it helps me find that thing without fishing around and treating them, you know, like a pin cushion, then great. It takes literally almost no extra time for me to incorporate that. So why not? Uh, so that's an option as well. But don't use septicane on full arches. That's the takeaway. Uh, oh, one other thing, buffer your anesthetic. Buffered anesthetic works far, far better because uh, anesthetic has to be packaged in an acidic form. Uh, hence, you know, while we buffer it up. Okay, so it has to be packaged acidic for shelf life. But the downside to that is that at the off-the-shelf pH, which is like, let's say three or something, it's 3,800 times less active at numbing a person than it would be once it's at physiologic pH. All right, so that's why you have to give a block and then sit there and twiddle your thumbs for 20 minutes because the body is having to buffer that up to physiologic pH before that anesthetic can do anything. So if you buffer it on the front end, well, now you've brought it up to physiologic pH before you even inject it. And you can buy the onset and various systems for that. What we do is, uh, and I did this for years and years, is we just buy off the shelf sodium bicarbonate, 8.3%. It's like five bucks for a 50 milliliter bottle instead of $8 per carpool with some of the commercial products. 
and we just use a little allergy tuberculin syringe. So it's a one to 10 dilution. So if you got a 1.8 millimeter or milliliter carpule, then you're gonna inject 0.18 of sodium bicarb into the uh, carpule before you inject it. And then you pop it in, inject it. It is so fast, right? It, I did this on my oral surgeon buddy and we timed it. I said, you know, give me a, tell me when you have profound all the way to the midline anesthesia from this mandibular block. And it was exactly one minute and we started drilling. So that is very effective. The other thing is if they are, uh, if they have tooth infections, their tissues all acidic already. That's why they're so hard to numb because you're trying to buffer up to physiologic pH. They're already acidic to start with. And the anesthetic is acidic. So buffering helps a lot with that too. So that's your takeaways. Buffer your anesthetic, use 2% solutions, not septicane, because you can give more volume, which you're gonna need, um, and use steroids too. That will help tremendously with post-op pain. Do you have any photos of the sutures on the temp? Ew. I might in a different uh, presentation, I'll try to remember to bring that up here in a bit. Uh, how do you subtract the guide from the denture at the beginning of your design so that you can have the occlusion before drilling the pins? Okay, so again, you've got your, your scan appliance guide, right? Which is just your denture with tubes built in it, right? And then you've also got an STL of the original denture. So what I would do is after I've made the uh, scan appliance guide, now you got to use mesh mixer, which I know is a dirty word to a lot of people, but go into mesh mixer and offset that surgical guide by like 0.3 millimeters. Okay. So offset it all the way around by 0.3 millimeters and then separate that and then subtract that offset surgical guide from your original denture. And what you're going to be left with is those teeth that fit down into the holes. Uh, that's, that's basically how you do it. Likewise, how do you get your surgery staged on your printing models, teeth, teeth extracted? So uh, I've got, I think that's the next thing I was going to show is on the segmentation. Granted, you can do it in Blue Sky yourself, but if you try to segment the jaws and then go segment all the teeth, you're going to spend about three hours doing it. It takes forever. So uh, I will come back to that in just a moment because uh, this service from Diagnacat does segmentation via artificial intelligence is amazing. And it does all the teeth, uh, all for kind of one price and it's not very expensive. It's a great, great deal. Can you send the CT scan of the jaws and dentures to me? Uh, I'm not sure which case, but assuming I can find them, I would be happy to. Uh, can transcend you smart denture conversion? Yeah, you can absolutely do that. Um, I would just want to know that the doc wants to use that on the front end. Uh, we don't supply the smart denture conversion, but I mean, you can purchase that from Blue Guy. And as long as you tell us that that's how you're going to do your conversion on the front end, then we won't even have to make holes through the occlusal. And now you have even less work to do with the uh, conversion. So yeah, I love the smart denture conversion. Can you briefly show you how you make the anesthetic guide? Uh, if you would remind me when we get to the end, when I'm on the software and I'd be happy to, it's very easy to do. Uh, good, background noise is not an issue because it's driving me nuts. Um, if you only have a surgical guide resin for your bone reduction guides, what dimensions and width, uh, you gotta make them a good bit beefier or you've gotta make just a bunch of them and expect that you might break some and have to swap it out. So when I did these in purely resin, I. I went as much as six or seven millimeters in buccal lingual thickness. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but man, when you get into surgery, it's a lot more. And then vertically, I've also got to make it thicker in dimensions. So maybe five, six millimeters that way. So uh, you can do that, but keep in mind that that may be all that you have, but you can absolutely outsource that to be printed in metal or milled in zirconia or whatever the heck else you want to do. Uh, I know that Burbank Dental Lab, they will do these jobs. Uh, like if you design one of these reduction guides and a grill guide, they can mill that. They've got, uh, you know, five axis mills that are the size of a bus that will do anything, regardless how complex the shape is. So uh, keep in mind that you can, at the end of the day, you've just generated an STL. Now it's just up to you material wise, what you're gonna fabricate that out of. So if you want something strong, send it out to be printed in metal. Uh, again, Oral Arts, Bertram Dental Lab, 
Um, I got another one that we use in California. I'm not sure if he's ready to start accepting more cases though. So I'll just leave it at those two for right now, Bertram and uh, Oral Arts. All right, cool. Thanks, Larry. Uh, so we'll keep on rolling here. Uh, so I threw this in. This is, and it actually doesn't show everything I want to show, but this is just a uh, case we just sent out this week of more of the new design. And so with this new design, it differs a little bit because instead of using a tooth positioning guide to position a reduction guide, instead of that, you can just put on, you just make a simple printed guide whose only purpose is drilling the pinholes. So you do it first thing, right? I, I will usually raise the buckle flap, but I'll put that uh, pin positioning guide on and I'm just drilling the pinholes. Then I take it off, throw it in the trash, you're done with it. Now that has uh, some advantages. Um, I mean, time-wise, it doesn't make a difference compared to the other, but what it enables me to do is to make the reduction guide with pins built into it. And this will be in the, the videos I'm showing uh, after this. But if you'll notice here, these three front holes for the pins, those are all 100% parallel. And what I'll do is after I've drilled these, and now I toss that guide, I'll do the extractions without any kind of guide in the way, which is nice. I like kind of not having it in the way. And then how do you position your reduction guide? Well, these three pins are not removable pins. They're actually part of your reduction guide. So since they're all parallel, you would have a similar looking bone reduction guide, but with three pins that actually extend off of it and go internal into the bone. And that's how it positions itself. So you push it all the way to the bone and then those back two pins are not parallel. You would just drop in two pins. So it's less work. I find it to be a much more stable design because now it's actually anchored internally as opposed to with removable pins, which have offset spacers and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's what I'll show you here in a moment. So this was the initial pin drill. There's the holes. And then I wish I had a picture that shows this not on here, but this reduction guide, the difference you see here is that there's only two pin tubes. And that's because the front three pins are not pins, they're part of your reduction guide and they're going internal to the bone. And that gives it a lot of stability and it's self positioning without the need of a tooth guide. So it, it also simplifies the design and the software, which is great. And then as far as the attachment of the components, it's still the magnetic design. Uh, it would be similar from that point forward. Okay, this is just some model work, uh, similar principle to how I did the denture teeth. If you want, you know, this is just for show, you don't have to do this. You can just print separate models, one with the teeth, then one of the reduced jaw. But I don't know, I like geeking out on stuff like this. So uh, part of this AI segmentation that I was gonna show you, since it does all the roots, then that incorporates the actual sockets into the model. So if I had their original intraoral scan and I'm, I Boolean subtract from that, this jaw with the sockets, what does that leave me? It leaves me this. Again, you need to offset your jaw with the sockets by about 0.2 to 0.3. And then when I subtract that, I'm left with this. And now you have a removable tooth section, which represents your bone reduction, which is kind of cool. All right, here's the jaw after bone reduction. And there is the drill guide in very low profile. Um, notice here, there's one disto angled implant and these are timing marks, a bit hard to see, but you can see them better here. Those are the timing marks that are built into the guide. So, you know, angled multis, you've got to get the timing and rotation and everything lined up in order for the multi to emerge through the hole. So it's easy with the blue sky kit. There's six notches on the driver. You're just going to align one of those notches to one of these things. Uh, and here you can see the pins. Uh, those are actually all part of the reduction guide. They're going internal and extending all the way to the lingual bone. Uh, so lots of stability with these and fewer removable pins to mess with. Just two are needed. And so oftentimes just to mimic the prosthetic pickup, you can just print your implants with the MMUTC cylinder on there and those will slide in and out. And I did that just to show how this seats over all of them simultaneously. And this one, we actually did the printed gingival skin. 
So you can kind of appreciate what I was talking about earlier, where once I cut these little connectors off, I still got a pink surface. There's nothing else to pink. And I think it looks a little more realistic. All right, so we talked about um, segmentation. You know, segmentation on these full arch and for any bone supported case, that, that is the price of admission to do any of it. And I've taught this so many times and historically I found segmentation to be the thing where I would lose everybody. They just couldn't get their mind around it and maybe were too cheap to farm it out because there's great services out there like uh, image 3D conversion through Lab Pronto that do an excellent job on it. But, you know, there's turnaround time and whatnot. And most people just were unwilling to do it themselves. Well, this is an awesome alternative. So I, I came in contact with this company, I don't know, three, four months ago, and I have used them an incredible amount. I mean, every case we do, I'm using this. So uh, now this, I had these slides already made from previously, but be aware that you can do Diagnacat AI segmentation through their website at diagnacat.com or whatever it is, but you can also do it directly through Lab Pronto. So it's a service within Lab Pronto. And again, it's very fast turnaround. And this is an example of that segmentation. So uh, the fee, Michael, maybe you could tell me it's, I don't know, 40 bucks or something. Does that sound about right? Yeah, let me just check that. that it's not right. that much. It's, uh, it's as cheap, if not cheaper than paying someone to do a segmentation. But the cool thing here is it happens almost immediately because it's all done by a computer through AI. And so I actually made a video today, which I'll be posting hopefully later tonight on my YouTube channel, if you want to watch it, of exactly going through submitting a case and how I get it back, how I pull them into Blue Sky and all that. But uh, you don't have to stitch these or anything like uh, it's a one button click and they're pulled into position. But notice here the difference. If I was doing a segmentation, I would end up with, you know, let's say it's the mandible. I would end up with one giant mandible bone and all of the teeth as one piece. I wouldn't have sockets or anything. Their segmentation actually segments out all the individual teeth. If your comb beam is big enough that it picks up facial soft tissue, it segments the facial soft tissue. It gets all these spindly little sinus bones, uh, nasal bones. It segments the nerve for you. It does the incisive canal for you. Uh, it will even do the airway. It's really incredible. So this is the airway of that patient. And if you, uh, if you do this like in their website, it's about a 10 minute turnaround. So you'd have to open an account, but then once you upload a job, it takes about 10 minutes for it to process and you have all of this back and you can pull it straight into Blue Sky, which is such a huge help because, you know, prior to this, every single case I did, I'd have to spend the first hour doing segmentation and that just sucked. So this has saved me mountains of time and look at how accurate the segmentation is on this. Notice the soft tissue outlines. Look at the bone contour, look at the root contours. Like it is really incredible uh, what this thing does. Okay, this is a different case. Same thing though, it's got facial soft tissue, individual teeth, maxilla, mandible, nerves, airway, all of that. So again, this is, if you're going to do it directly through their website. However, if you uh, already have a Lab Pronto account, just do it through Lab Pronto. It's, it's the same end uh, thing, right? You're, you're still getting the Diagnacat AI segmentation and it's zero effort, right? If you do it through their website, they've got a, a discount code that you can do. It's uh, CG2022, you get a free first case. Uh, but it's, I think about $49 per jaw. Actually, I say that it is going to be $49 per jaw. I think at the moment that covers all the jaws and everything, teeth and everything for 49 bucks. That's, that's cheap. Um, and it just kind of works off of exports just like Blue Sky Plan does. And so that's their interface. And again, alternatively, you can do it directly in Lab Pronto. Uh, the result is the same either way, but it, honestly, it's an amazing service. There's not a ton of stuff I get super fired up about that have made my life that much easier, but man, this one has truly made a big, big difference. Uh, and thank God, because I still don't have time to breathe with all the junk we're doing. So if I was doing segmentations on top of that, I would be jumping off a cliff or something. 
Uh, the, another cool thing that it does is a radiologic report. Now this should not be used as the sole means of diagnosis, but it does a darn good job at, you know, pointing out pathology and giving you a differential diagnosis. It will do a tooth by tooth analysis showing you uh, percent bone loss, uh, if there's periapical radiolucencies, how many canals are in each tooth. All of that is just included as part of that. So this is the radiologic report. If we were to go through that, again, if you're interested, I've got a video I'm going to be posting soon, uh, hopefully tonight on that. But I mean, look at this. You can see this tooth has one canal, one root, moderate bone loss. Like it's just really impressive. All right. Uh, let me just check these two questions and then we'll finish this thing out. Uh, we talk about zygo guides today, probably, you know, I'm going to go over my two hours if I do that, but I do have a video on my YouTube channel, you know, making a zygo guide is not honestly very complex. There's one nuance to it, which is that you basically, if you only have one guide to those drills are so long that you get a huge wag factor. So what you do is you duplicate that implant and you get two tubes, one at the point of penetration and one further up towards the zygoma. And then you just build a guide that incorporates both of those. But I, I do have a YouTube video on my channel doing exactly that. Uh, and then Kim, yeah, the uh, anesthetic guide, when I get into software at the very end, I will try to show you how to do that. All right. So what, obviously I can't, I can't sit here and do a detailed video of how I do these. Again, it's three hours per arch on these cases. But I, what I did is I tried to do videos capturing the high points and time lapsing it and only slowing down at the important stuff. So this is a case I actually, you know, got sent today that I had to work up. So I thought, well, crap, I'm going to knock two birds out with one stone and, and record some of it for this webinar. So this was a really large field of view comb beam and I submitted it to Diagnocat. I got the segmentation and this is the facial soft tissue I got back from it. I mean, that is that is really good. And that looks equivalent to almost a facial scan just without the color. Now we use in our practice facial scanners because man, how do you miss a midline if you can stitch their face to the models, right? You can't get a canted smile when you can see their inner pupillary, you can see their allotragus. And so I love that, but very few people have a facial scanner. However, if you take a larger field of view comb beam, then if you do the Diagnocat segmentation, you're gonna get a model like this. And now again, I can see inner pupillary. I can see allotragus, all of that. So I'm gonna just start these videos and I'm gonna just narrate them because they don't have sound. Uh, but here, what I've done is I find it to be very useful when I'm doing my setup to have some planes like this. So we're in mesh mixer here. And all I've done is taken that face and I've pulled in a plane. So that mesh mix button at the upper left, you can pull in a simple plane. I'll make it like half a millimeter thick and, and really good and wide. I'll do a vertical one that goes straight through the midline of the face. That tells me now where to set teeth to on the midline. And then the one by the nose, that is parallel to allotragus. And then I duplicate it and pull it down. And so I can see where his lip uh, position is at rest. So I wanna make my incisor be a millimeter or two longer than that. So now if I want to do my setup, then I can just literally pull this, uh, these planes into the case and it's completely dummy proof. I mean, how do you mess that up? So that's what I've done here is I've combined those and I'm gonna save this and just pull it into my blue sky plan file. So again, my starting point on all of these cases uh, obviously segmentation and all that kind of stuff, but I'm starting from either a 2D simulation, which I convert to a 3D wax up, or in this case, or if I had a facial scan, I can make these planes. And now doing that setup, I turn the transparency down halfway and I'm going to go to the denture module. Okay, so I'll pick a library of teeth, pull them in and watch. Now this is sped up 4X, but don't blink because you're going to miss it. I mean, my setup is done right there we're done i mean that's incredible uh so man it's just so dummy proof and you know i know that those are oriented correctly in the face i'm not depending on extrapolating from pictures or anything like that's just so amazing to me so now that's my tooth setup and it's hard to appreciate from looking here but this is not where i would have set those teeth if i was doing this without that face 
they seem to be offset more to the left side of his arch because he's got a good bit of facial asymmetry. So extremely useful here. So this is my tooth setup. And now that I've got the teeth set up, I can plan the implants backwards from it. All right, so here I'm gonna uh, go ahead and measure from the occlusal surface backwards, 15 to 17, okay? And that red line, that is 15 millimeters. So what's that tell you about that implant? That means it's out of the plane of occlusion and that sucker's gotta go bye-bye because it's, it's not useful or you're gonna have to have a very weak spot in your prosthetic. So that was, uh, helpful to determine that I'm not gonna be able to use that implant. So now I'm positioning some anterior implants. I usually will try to position my anterior implants first, as far anterior as possible. And then I'll try to get an implant on each side as far posterior as possible. And then whatever space remains between, I'll fill in with more implants. So now that I've got that in place, I can see I could use a bigger implant and you see, I've got my 17 millimeters of space. I've got good bone all around it. And usually what I'll do is just duplicate these implants and pull them to the next side. All right. And again, having that transparency on the, the models is very useful to help see your alignment. So I've duplicated it. I'm going to move this. I can see that incisive canal. So I just pull over lateral enough to be out from that. I'm making sure I'm coming lingual to the incisal edges. And you'll notice one of the things I'm very particular about doing on these full arches is making sure that the platforms of all my implants are even and on the same plane. You don't want a roller coaster occlusal plane. All right, so there, uh, this is front two, and then I will do the posteriors. Now I'm gonna jump forward a little bit. All right, oops, let me go back here very briefly. In the posterior. So I like to get implants posterior, you know, at first and second molars when possible. But here's what I learned. When I went from the occlusal surface of my ideal wax up, if I go 15 millimeters, I'm already in the sinus. So that tells me, unless we go FP1, posterior implants are out of the question here, which means that if I wanna get some uh, distal support, I'm probably gonna have to place some distal angled implants. Okay, so that's what I learned here. So instead of that, we're going to now just place a couple of disto angled implants. So inserting another implant, and this time I'm gonna angle it. Now, once I position this thing within the bone, you know, avoiding sinus and all that kind of stuff, then I will change this custom abutment that I've got on. I usually just do like a 15 millimeter uh, long, five millimeter diameter custom abutment, but if I have to angle them, then I'll change that abutment and I will make that a 30 degree or a 17 degree angled, just like your multi-unit would be. So here I'm changing my abutment to a 30 degree. And this is something I've noticed throws a lot of people. So once you do that, you don't have control over which way it goes. You see it's going to the lingual there. So in your 3D window, hover on that implant and the widget will come up and now grab the blue one. And now you're not changing position, you're just spinning it on its axis to change the timing. And then I can see where my emergence would be. So that's where I want it. All right, now I'm gonna do my other distal most implant. I'm measuring my space, making sure I'm deep enough. I put on the angled multi, try to avoid that implant. And now I'm looking and I see, okay, there's enough space that I can put one more between those two. I'll time lapse in here because I don't want to sit here and show the whole thing, but I had room to put six implants in. All right, so there's my final implant positions. Everything's lined up, looking good. All in an ideal prosthetic position. And there's my implant. So at that point, I would send this out to the doctor get them to verify my wax up, my, my 2D simulation and the implant positions, make any changes that they want. And now that I've got those implants in position, I'm going to uh, go ahead. Actually, what did I do next? I think I'm gonna make uh, the bone reduction guide next. So the reason I came over to the denture module here is because remember with this new guide design, 
I need that thing to slide in from the anterior because it's not going to be attached to a tooth guide initially. So what I'm doing is I'm indicating a straight from the front path of draw in the denture software. And what that does in step one is it gives me this block out model. So I'm just exporting that and then I abandon the denture process, okay? Now, I'm, these cases, I'm constantly back and forth between mesh mixer and blue sky, mesh mixer and blue sky. So I just keep one mesh mixer window open and I just keep pulling files into it. Don't close it or anything. And then I've got my blue sky plan open. And every time I make a change from one to the other, right before I leave blue sky, I'll push save on my case so that if something crashes, I don't lose it. So normally I would make a guide in blue sky, but you know, with these, the way I'm doing that path of draw, I like to smooth this up. And so here I just opted to, on that path of draw model, I just offset a surface by 0.2, just like Blue Sky would with a guide. And then I offset that again by three. That gives me a three millimeter thickness. And this is the precursor to my buckle bone reduction guide. Now, this is something else I've done. In the past, if you've seen my videos on making bone reduction cuts, what I've always done is uh, just make the cuts directly through the bone and through a pre-made guide. Um, I don't have the time to go into it, but I prefer not to do that because the way it generates the mesh. And so nowadays what I do is I just generate a random wafer type shape like this. Uh, and again, I do that in mesh mixer, or you could pre-save this and have a bunch of them already made that you pull directly into Blue Sky. And now I'm going to do my bone reduction cuts through the jaw but really what I'm after is to reduce that wafer because instead of trying to make the cuts on everything, what I'm instead trying to do is generate a plane of reduction. And that plane, now I can subtract it from the jaw. I have my, redu my reduced jaw. I can subtract it from my guide. I have my reduction guide. I can subtract that from the bottom of my denture. And now I have a prosthesis that's three millimeters off the bone. There's a lot of value in this. Um, so now I'm going to start making my reduction cuts. So I look from the posterior, I've got my, my, uh, teeth on because I want my cuts to be parallel to the plane of occlusion. So I'm kind of getting even with that. I've got the transparency turned on, on the models. And once I do that, I'm going to use the cut all tool, which is at the bottom of your surfaces panel. You got to have your implants turned on so that you can see the platforms, right? But you want to make this cut not parallel to the implant platform, but parallel to the plane of occlusion. So now cut all, and let me point this out real quick here. Historically, when I did these bone reduction cuts, I would use cut all and I would try to, you know, make a straight line. And depending on how much coffee I'd had, like I would have miserably failed at it if I did one right now, because I've had a bunch, but I'd get this wavy, ugly line. Simplest thing in the world that I just figured out probably two months ago is instead of trying to make your cut across, start it at the right level and come up and over and then come down. And what that does is it leaves a straight line between these and you end up with a very flat plane cut that is much, much nicer than what I could do freehand. You see that flat plane I end up with purely just by changing the direction that I draw the line from. So now that I've got that, all my other cuts are going to be based off of that one. So notice here, I'm orienting my model where I'm looking straight through that cut so that I can stay in that plane with all my remaining cuts. All right, now I'm going to pick up there and I'll go just distal to the next implant. I don't ever try to do this all in one shot. I always do one, max two implants at a time. All right, there's my next cut. And now I keep spinning it a little more. Get flat through that plane and repeat that one more time on this posterior. Now you're always gonna have the distal corner of that implant if it's angled deeper than the crestal one, right? Well, that's just, it is what it is. You'll have to do some bone profiling. And then if you want to, you can finish out that cut. So once again, cut all, and then I'll just swing back and I'm just going to try to make a nice flat plane to this, uh, this jaw. But notice here, I, I honestly don't care so much about getting the reduction cuts on the bone. I'm more concerned with doing it on this wafer thingy that I made, because what I'll end up doing is just subtracting this wafer 
from my jaws, from my guides. And that's what gives me my bone reduction guides and all that kind of thing. All right, so here is my reduction cut. All right, now this is a little abstract and it's, uh, I apologize, it's hard to explain given the time I've got. Uh, just bear with me. Hopefully, if you think on it a little while, it'll make sense. So now if I come in to my mesh mixer case, I'll pull in that occlusal plane that I just generated. So the bottom side here, and I, I can fix that hole. The bottom side right here, that represents my plane of reduction. So what I'm going to do is delete the sides and the bottom and all that. I just want that plane of reduction. This is what I was after because now this is much wider than the jaw, right? I can just save this and repeatedly use it over and over. I don't have to go back and repeat steps on reduction. Now, the other thing is, do you notice how when you do the cuts in Blue Sky Plan, you see how you get this crazy funky geometry to the mesh? That's one of the reasons I don't love doing it uh, 100% blue sky will do it sometimes, but I would rather have a very regular mesh like this. And so I just remesh that because it's going to perform much better for all these Boolean functions that I'll be doing throughout the case. And then if I have any little sharp corners where the cuts transition to one another, I'm just going to, you know, buzz over those real quick. I, I want to make this thing nice and smooth. It won't be 100% flat, right? Because you've got contours, you've got sinuses to avoid. Um, but it's a generally flat plane. And uh, now if I wanted to, let's say, make the reduced jaw and make it a really clean model with a very regular mesh, if I just extrude that up and then subtract that from that original maxilla, then I'm left with the reduced jaw. So I'm constantly saving all these files, making sure I don't lose anything. So here what I've done is just selected that plane of reduction I'm gonna extrude it out, extrude it corollary. And then I'm just going to subtract that shape from my jaw, Boolean difference. And again, you can do Boolean functions in Blue Sky now. It is in the model editing module. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's in the Crown and Bridge module. Um, and it, it works great. You know, it's just a matter of, I just try to be most efficient. It really depends on what program I'm in at the moment where I do those functions. Um, you could do almost all of this entirely in Blue Sky Plan. I've just found, you know, mixes of workflows where there's certain steps I can perform quicker, or easier uh, in, in Mesh Mixer. And I, we always get the question, you know, will you add these functions to Blue Sky? I mean, be careful what you wish for. This is always the challenge uh, for Michael and our developers is, you know, could we add them? Yeah, we could. But at some point, you got to ask, you know, what are 98% of users using? And if you add tons of super advanced features, now the program gets bogged down and it makes it hard for the 98% to understand. You end up with a Photoshop style program that is impossible to navigate. So that's, that's the challenge there. So here's one of the other reasons I do this because I want a 100% uniform thickness to this guide. So if I take that plane of reduction and I offset it by three and a half to give me a three and a half millimeter vertical height, that's what you're seeing here. So now I could subtract that from the top of that pre-reduction guide. And uh, again, could you do this with a hand cut in Blue Sky? Yes, but again, this is the kind of function you, you don't want added to Blue Sky. It's just going to bog the program down and make it insanely impossible to use. Um, there's just certain applications I find that to be helpful for. So notice I haven't placed pins yet. I wait until this point because that reduction guide is so thin that if I had positioned those ahead of time, I very well may have ended up where my pins were not within that reduction guide. So now that I've got the reduction guide, I'm placing those three pins anteriorly. They're all perfectly parallel. And I'll even go back and right click, align with, and make sure that they're 100% parallel. And now I'm gonna place my two posterior ones. Now these are gonna be off angle because these are basically the pins that just lock it all in place. So remember, you're not gonna have pins extending buckly. You'll have those extensions coming off the lingual and those go internal to the bone. And then these will be your only two removable pins. 
So I'm doing that. I'm trying to avoid the sockets. Again, very helpful to have that Diagonal Cat segmentation where I can see the individual sockets and I can try to position my pen strategically between them. So this is a cool trick. Watch this. Uh, pause it for just a second. So I've got this shape right now. This is my reduction guide, but it has no pen tubes or anything in it. What's an easy, quick way that I could incorporate this into a reduction guide that does have these pins? Think about what you do with a denture scan appliance, right? You've got a denture and now you turn on all these tubes and you push scan appliance guide and it just duplicates it, but it builds those tubes in. That's exactly what I'm gonna do here. Cause all I'm trying to do is duplicate this shape, but add in these two pin tubes. Now that I know where to position them adequately. So I just hit create scan appliance guide and looky there, I've got a guide in no time at all. And then those other three pins I'm exporting and I'm gonna cut those up, okay? So this one, notice I'm plain cutting, that one I'm plain cutting, that one I'm plain cutting. And now I merge those as part of that reduction guide. So this would be my final reduction guide prior to adding the indexing features. All right, so this would be pre-stack. Um, okay, so next video. I'm trying to roll here. I think I'm, I'm going to lose again on my two hours, aren't I, Michael? All right, so now I'm making the drill guide. So what I'm doing is I'm setting my tube parameters to the Blue Sky Fully Guided Kit. Um, I'm exporting those, and I make them solid in Mesh Mixer because the geometry of the mesh straight out of the plan is, is not conducive to making these little connectors. So this, uh, the first thing I'm doing is those disto angled ones, right? The tube would be impinging. So I'm plane cutting those down where it digs into the bone so that I won't be held up by those. So I'm gonna plane cut that, that uh, impinging corner off. And now I'm gonna build a connector. Okay, so I gotta give some credit here to my partner, Ben Kellum, uh, because I think this is Ben's greatest contribution to the world so far is discovering this unknown feature in Mesh Mixer called tube handle. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm highlighting a connector piece on each thing and then under edit, there's something called tube handle. Makes no sense, have no idea what tube handle means, but look what it does. It connects those two pieces instantaneously with a beautiful connection. So I'll just repeat that between every tube. And what I end up with is basically a guide tube bar. Okay. It's obviously time lapse. I'm, I'm trying to go through this fast. And now I'll do the last one. All right. So again, I don't know how Ben found that, but that has been a game changer for me. I use that feature all the time. I'm going to use that also to connect in my indexing features. So what am I doing now? Oh, so now this is probably the money part that you're all uh, wanting to see is how to make the indexing connections between stack components, right? So you can make any version of these you want yourself. Um, I, I designed a uh, type that are conducive to those little three millimeter magnets that I made. What this part is, is a, it's a pin to index and a magnet in one. So what I'll do is I'll position one of these and I'm gonna try to get it nice and flat relative to the plane of reduction with that lip between them parallel to that plane of reduction. Now, what you're seeing there is the upper pin and magnet, the lower pin and magnet, and then those two components that are kind of long are actually parts I pre-designed to subtract out so that if, if this was impinging into the hole for that pin, for example, I can subtract those and it, it clears out the space. Again, this is uh, something you can custom make. There's a hundred different ways you could design these, but the key component to this is those pins all have to have the exact same path of draw everywhere that you put them. So once I get one of them positioned ideally, I can't just go grab another and try to position it. Rather, what I've got to do is duplicate this and pull it around and I can pull it, I can spin it on the, the Z dimension like that, but I cannot rotate it in the X or the Y because once I do, those are out of parallel now, okay? 
So I'm going to pull this one over. And the reason I have the teeth on is because I don't want these things buried up under the teeth. Because remember, I've got to eventually make a stacked conversion prosthesis. Unfortunately, that's the video that got eaten, but uh, so be it. If you know how to make the stack drill guide, then making the stack conversion prosthesis, you're just making a horseshoe denture and then attaching these same things to it. You're going to save these when they're in their final form. And then those can just be added to your conversion prosthesis or the drill guide or whatever. It doesn't matter. Anything else you want to stack on there. So they're all four positioned. They're all completely parallel. And now I've combined them. And now you'll see these parts I'm clicking. I'll select all of those and I'm going to separate them off. The reason for those components are to subtract from the reduction guide. So anywhere that they're impinging into that, those are areas that I've got to clear out the space for that pin. Okay. So I accepted that and get rid of those little floaters. But you see right there where I'm pointing to, if I didn't clear that out ahead of time, then I'm going to have part of the reduction guide impinging internal to where those pins go. So now you start to see this, right? You've got your upper pins and magnets and your lower pins and magnets. Now I'm separating off the lower ones. So they all get positioned together and then broken apart because otherwise you can't maintain that parallelism. So I'll separate these off and I'm going to combine those. Uh, I'll do a Boolean union to the reduction guide so that that all becomes one part. So you can see now that those have, are, are broken in half, you can see that there's a through and through hole. That's where the pin, the male female pin goes. Each of these is a three millimeter socket for those little magnets. So just like I did the connections between implant tubes, if I have these where they're not joined together, you know, the two posterior ones impinged into each other. So when I merged them, they're, they're all one piece, but here they're not. So instead, what I'm gonna do is select the back side of this. And then I'm gonna select the buckle of that reduction guide. And then I'm gonna do that tube handle function. And that will merge those together with a big beefy connector. So I'm going, this is normal speed right now, just to show one of these, then it'll speed up again. So now I'm doing the buckle surface of the reduction guide. Where do I want to connect these two together? And now with those two selections done, I'm going to hit that tube handle feature and it will join them all together. All right, tube handle. Sometimes you need to smooth it for that to function properly, but now you see that connection I've made. All right, so now speed it up, we'll do the next one. All right, so now that's my final bone reduction guide with the pins and the magnet indexes. Now the upper components, those are all separated off. Save those. You've got to save them before you do anything else to them because remember, you're going to add those to multiple things. So once I join them to a drill guide, I don't want to have to cut the drill guide off to now join them to a prosthesis. So now that I've saved them outside the program, now I'm going to take that guide tube bar that I made previously and I'm going to start splicing all this stuff together. So exact same thing. I'm going to use the select tool and uh, basically bridge these components together. And you see how I was rolling over. Notice here, when I click, I'm not rolling over that edge. That's a function of the crease angle, which is right here. If I set a high crease angle, then I can make a selection. But when I hit like a hard 90 degree angle, it won't roll over that, which is what I'm wanting here. All right. So we're going to merge these tube handle, and then we're just going to repeat on the remainders. And there is my finalized drill guide. Okay, so 
again, the computer ate my, my video of doing the denture, but imagine you've just made a horseshoe denture. That's not rocket science. I got 45 videos on that. The, the tricky part people don't understand is how do I join that to the indexing parts? Well, now you know, because you've just saved those parts. Now you just do that same bridge function or, or add tube feature between the prosthesis and the uh, upper components, right? So there's the drill guide. And now the last, well, is this the last, uh, let me see. It's the same video. Yeah, that's the same video. So yeah, really the next step would be the prosthesis. But since I don't have that, the last step would be you need the pin guide uh, to do your initial pin placement. Okay, so this is stupid easy. This is just making a guide. The only nuance to it is that this model, remember, you're going to have flapped on the buckle already. So I just make a merged model of the soft tissue of the teeth. I'm sorry, the soft tissue and teeth from the intraoral scan and the maxilla. I indicate a path of draw over those and I just design a guide so that this will all seat over that all together. So I want those pin tubes to extend as close to the bone as possible to get a good fit. And there's your final pin guide. So, uh, you know, anyone can do that step. I think the part that tricks most people is how do you make the indexing components? Well, now, you know, um, that's how I do it. Again, I would stress to you, if you're going to jump into this, there's a lot of nuances you got to be aware of within the patent space that I just won't have time to cover, nor should I, because again, I'm not a lawyer, but understand those if you're going to do this, because you, you definitely need to respect the intellectual property of the systems out there. And there are patents within the space, multiple of them. So you need to make sure with whatever design you're doing that you are trying to stay clear of those patents and respect those. Um, so with that said, I think I'm done and I still didn't make the two hour mark, but I was closer than I have been previously. Uh, if, if you want to learn more about this in a hands-on setting, uh, there's two courses where I teach the stackable type guides. One is our guided surgery level two at Transcend Dental Education. Uh, we've got one of those coming up in the next couple of months in Huntsville. The other is the advanced full arch guided course that myself and Danny Doming do, which we don't have one scheduled right now, but we're hoping to schedule one 4th of July timeframe in Hawaii. Good excuse to go to Hawaii. Um, but again, if you're interested, go to our website and check that out. If you look at this and are thinking this is insane, there's no way I'm going to do that myself and you want to farm it out to someone else, then we're happy to do that for you or not, whatever. Um, but that I think is it. Any questions, Michael? Uh, there's a couple that came in on Q&A. Maybe just take another question or two. Um, okay. How much for a facial scanner? They're going to range from 7,000, say for a Shining 3D Ein scan, up to 17,000 for the Instarisa, um, which we have both. They both work great. Instarisa is a little more tailored to dental use, um, but they both get you the same endpoint. We also have a facial scanner on our CareStream 9600 comb beam, which is awesome because uh, I like the idea of them just sitting there and they can smile and the machine does it and it goes around and it's pre-calibrated distance and all that, as opposed to, you know, a wand type thing like the others, but obviously a CareStream comb beam, if you don't need that, that's an expensive uh, facial scanner. Uh, but yeah, that's the range. In planning, would you use a custom angled abutment that angles from the implant neck or an actual abutment? I usually will use the custom angled abutment. I'll put it at 17 or 30. Yes, you can do it with a multi, an angled multi with a temp cylinder. But again, at some point, you've got to you've got to subtract that from your prosthesis. And if you just subtract that regular abutment, well, now you don't have a big enough hole unless you offset it or enlarge it or something. So what I do is I just do a five millimeter custom abutment with that angle. And then after I do the path of draw, that's what I subtract. And that makes these holes where they're perfect and everything draws. Uh, tube handle function for anesthetic guide. Yep, <laughs> Larry, brain fried. At least I did something right here. Is there a way to get your implant connection and MUA angulation to match your planning exactly? Yes, that is the purpose of those timing marks. Uh, which 
again, I don't have time to cover today, but like pretty much everything else, I got a video on it. So if you want to know how to do that, generating precise timing marks on a surgical guide. And what this is about is how you can create those marks on your guide so that you know that the flat of your implant in the surgery is ending up in the exact position as the flat was in the software. That's ultimately what we're, we're after. And if you do that, then yes, your multis are gonna line up with your pre-made holes and all of that. Uh, let's see, any others? Oh yeah. Um, today's show, quite a viewer decided not to take local anesthetic. He wanted to transcend dental magication. Uh, that's a good one, Kim. Uh, thank you. Good presentation. All right, cool. Um, all right. I said I would do this, so I'm going to do it very, very briefly. Uh, so I'm not a liar. This is that case I've been showing everything out of. And let me just, um, let me go to a model that just has, let's say the maxilla. Uh, segmented maxilla. There it is. All right. So what I would suggest you do is just go up, add an implant. I'm gonna turn all this junk off except for that maxilla. There we go. So I would add an implant, but I would do like a custom implant. So let's say a custom implant and I'd make it, I don't know, 10 by one, right? By one. Now I'm gonna just drop that in somewhere back here. And then I'm gonna have to kind of go searching for it a little bit. All right, so there, do you see that? When I went in that uh, tangential slice, right here is that palatal frame. And so I'm gonna get it roughly positioned and then I'm gonna have to spin it around. And now I can see I need to be more in I think, that angle. And maybe hair more that way. Let me zoom out and make sure I'm in the right position, in fact. And I am. All right. You see that? Now, this, this particular model, the canal is small, so you don't have it visible right here. But again, look in your look in your 2D slices, and you can see that you are in fact in that palatal foramen. Okay, so right there, that would be the trajectory that a needle needs to go in. And if you do that, then that's going to track all the way up into this pterygoid space, if you use a long needle, hub it out and just hit them with a, a big carpule of anesthetic and they're gonna be numb to their eyeballs. Now, the other nuance, you, you're gonna have to turn on a guide tube, right? So let's turn on a guide tube. And I don't want a huge guide tube because that's not gonna really guide me. So I'm gonna make my whole diameter be, uh, let's just make it like 0.75. 0.75 and then I need to see where is the tissue here so somewhere I have a tissue model there we go okay so uh, back under my implant list I can make the height of this be let's say eight and then I can scoot the offset up, right? Because height adds to the bottom. Offset is how high the top is. So I'm gonna increase the offset. I know. Uh, I'm gonna just change this to like 12, right? Because you just need it sticking up out of the tissue enough that it actually gets some guidance of the trajectory. Now just make a guide on that. And that's what's going to give you your nerve block guide, okay? So now, if I did that on both sides, and I just made a soft tissue support guide, you got a V2 block guide. And uh, I mean, you could do that with an inferior alveolar block if you're missing those or whatever. Uh, I don't generally have trouble finding those except for this V2. It can be difficult to find sometimes. So that's how that is done. Um, will be available as a recording, yes sir, it will. Uh, Michael, I'm going to shut up and you can tell them when all that's going to be available. I uh, appreciate everybody. And again, if you got any, well, I would like to say if you have questions, email me, but 
if I'm being realistic, I'm not going to see it. <laughs> I'm just too overwhelmed with too much stuff right now. So would love to help you if I can happen upon the message, but I'm not sure I will. But again, if you come to a course, you're going to have a captive audience and, and you can pepper me with whatever you want there. So I appreciate everyone and I'll see you later. Okay, so just to wrap this up, um, first of all, this was streamed directly to Facebook. So this is ready live on Facebook. You could watch the recording in the Blue Sky Bio user group. We're going to have it on YouTube and have it on our website within a day or two. Uh, so the recording will definitely be available. Regarding the C credits, as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll be sending those within a week or two of the webinar presentation. And please check uh, blueskyplan.com forward slash webinars 2022 to see the schedule for the upcoming webinar presentations and to access past recordings. Um, that pretty much wraps up today's webinar presentation. Corey, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you for all the videos that you Ooh. make, the continuing education, all of the innovation for Blue Sky Bio, for Blue Sky Plan, for dentistry in general. It's truly incredible. Well, same to you. Appreciate you. And everybody, thank you for attending, and we hope to uh, see you at future webinar presentations.